Now, a House Government Reform Subcommittee hearing on airline security. Witnesses include representatives of the Air Transport Association, Airline Pilots Association, and the Association of Flight Attendants. The former security director for LL Airlines will also answer questions. California Congressman Doug Ose chairs the panel. It's about three hours. Good afternoon. Welcome to the subcommittee hearing. The tragic events of September 11, 2001 have shaken the confidence of the U.S. government and its citizens in the nation's air security. Immediately after September 11, the President and, and Congress began to examine the existing system, including the laws, regulations, and actual practices governing air security. Much was found to be lacking. Some changes were made immediately by the President, such as having more federal law enforcement officials on airplanes and at airports. Other changes were quickly made by the airlines, such as locking all cockpit doors. On November 19th, the President signed a Comprehensive, comprehensive Aviation and Transportation Security Act written by this Congress. This law places responsibility for air security in the hands of the United States Department of Transportation. Within one year, DOT is required to primarily use federal employees for passenger and baggage screening. In addition, the law addresses many other areas of air security. Today, we plan to examine how to make this new system work. As we are talking about people's lives, there is no room for error. We will hear from an expert in air security and other witnesses representing the airlines, airports, pilots, flight attendants, and consumers about what regulations are needed to ensure air security. Federal regulations specify detailed procedures to ensure uniform implementation of laws. The new law establishes emergency procedures, allowing the DOT to issue interim final regulations without any public notice or comment. Today's hearing provides a useful forum for congressional and public input into the regulatory decision-making process that's currently underway. Even before the Airline Deregulation Act of 1978, there were minimal federal protective regulations governing air security. In 1981, DOT's Federal Aviation Administration issued minimum, minimal regulations on airplane operator security, including less than one page on screening of passengers and property. Currently, FAA has only one page of codified rules on this subject. Also, FAA has non-codified directives and customized provisions in its contracts with each of the airlines, since airlines to date have been responsible for air security, including screening of passengers, carry-on baggage, and checked baggage. FAA's approach led to non-uniform and unpredictable screening practices across airlines. Following the July 1996 TWA Flight 800 airplane crash, shortly after takeoff from JFK in New York, in October of 96, Congress passed the Federal Aviation Reauthorization Act of 1996. This law required FAA to certify companies providing security screening and to improve the training and testing of security screeners through development of uniform performance standards for providing security screening services. Even after a November 2000 law established a deadline for FAA to issue an implementing rule for this 1996 law, FAA failed to do so. I'm amazed that in over five years, FAA has failed to issue a final rule on certification of screening companies. The new administration has realized there is a problem. In its April 2001 U.S. Department of Transportation Performance Report Fiscal Year 2000 and Performance Plan Fiscal Year 2002, DOT stated that it did not meet its 2000 performance target for aviation security and, quote, screener performance has not improved enough, end quote. To ensure the most effective approach, the new, new law provides for a two-year pilot program at five airports to test different screening approaches using private security firms instead of federal employees. In addition, the law provides that after a three-year period, an option for any airport to meet strict federal standards for passenger and baggage screening by using private by using private security firms instead of federal employees. The, new, the, 
The new law also includes provisions on many other aspects of air security, such as hiring criteria, identification, screening of airport employees, employee training, identifying passengers, and the like. I look forward to testimony of our witnesses today on what DOT should include in its air security regulations to ensure uniformity and maximum protection for airport and airline employees as well as passengers. Ladies and gentlemen, I travel every single weekend. This is a critical issue. This hearing is very timely. I am pleased now to recognize my colleague from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing on security of air travel. This is, as you said, a timely and important topic, and I also want to thank our witnesses that are going to share their expertise with us today, and I'm particularly pleased to welcome our colleague, Mr. Micah. The Aviation and Transportation Security Act is a major victory for the American people. This legislation, if done right, will help restore public confidence in the safety of our airlines. It can also give our economy a needed boost by encouraging air travel and promoting other hospitality sector businesses, including travel agencies, hotels, and restaurants. The Aviation and Transportation Security Act establishes a national system for air security. Security screeners will now be able and train professionals working on the federal government who will meet uniform high performance standards. Federalization of the security system should also promote efficient sharing of intelligence information, a clear chain of command, and accountability for maintaining security in and around airplanes and airports. The American people overwhelmingly supported full federalization of aviation security functions, and I am pleased that Congress has delivered these protections to the public. The law also requires other important measures to protect our aviation system. It will expand the Federal Air Marshal Service, require criminal background checks of all persons with access to secured areas, and mandate the reinforcement of all cockpit doors. All checked baggage must be screened by explosive detection equipment by the end of next year, and checked baggage must be screened through other means in the interim. The Aviation and Transportation Security Act establishes new Transportation Security Administration within the Department of Transportation and is charged with carrying out these provisions. The TSA has a lot of work to do under difficult circumstances. This hearing could have been a useful forum for us to hear from the Department of Transportation and give the Department and TSA guidance on their next steps. It's unfortunate that no representative of the Department chose to be with us here today. Nevertheless, there are several points that I urge the Secretary of Transportation to bear in mind as he implements this law. The new federal security system gives us an excellent opportunity to help those in the airline industry who have lost their jobs since September 11. When hiring federal security personnel, we should give first priority to those in the airline industry who have been laid off. I have co-sponsored legislation, H.R. 3067, to give these workers priority, and a version of that provision was included in the Aviation Security Bill passed by the House. While that provision is not in the final law, the Secretary of Transportation has the authority to help those laid-off workers by giving them priority for the new jobs, and I urge him to do so. It is also vitally important that we provide federal security personnel with appropriate compensation and the benefits that we provide all other federal workers. Uniform federal benefits are a matter of equity, and they are necessary to attract and to retain a high caliber of dedicated people to perform those critical security functions. The Aviation and Transportation Sec Security Act conference report included an expectation that the Secretary will establish benefits and conditions of employment for federal security screeners. The report also stated that these federal workers should have access to federal health benefits, life insurance, retirement benefits, and workers' compensation benefits, as well as whistleblower protections. I encourage Secretary Mineta to comply with the Congress's directive in this regard, and I thank you for the opportunity to participate, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. We are pleased today to be joined by the Chairman of the Subcommittee on Aviation from Transportation and Infrastructure, and the distinguished gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, also thank you, uh, Mr. Tierney. I'm pleased to join you today, and I think this is a very important uh, hearing, uh, uh, which is focusing on uh, what regulations are needed to ensure our air safety. and. I uh, commend you and the uh, subcommittee on your important oversight, uh, responsibility, and work. Um, I want to, again, thank you for 
allowing me to testify first. Uh, we've just gotten through uh, putting together in a record uh, time frame a uh, major overhaul of our nation's uh, aviation and transportation uh, security uh, system, and I think this uh, hearing couldn't be uh, more timely, uh, particularly today as you focus on the important uh, issue of rulemaking and aviation security. Uh, I believe one of the uh, most momentous uh, provis provisions of the recently signed Aviation and Transportation Security Act is the unprecedented provision giving the new uh, Transportation Security Undersecretary the uh, authority to pass rules in an expedited uh, fashion. In fact, if you look at the legislation we passed, uh, there's nothing in that entire uh, legislation that is more significant than, again, this unprecedented authority that we gave uh, to this uh, new transportation security czar to put rules in place on an expedited basis. On July 11th of this year, uh, my aviation subcommittee heard very disturbing testimony about the Department of Transportation and the Federal Aviation Administration's inability to pass rules in a uh, timely manner. Let me give you some uh, examples that we heard in that hearing. Uh, it takes the Department of Transportation, on average, 3.8 years to finalize a rule. Uh, we also had testimony that with FAA, it takes a median time of two and a half years, uh, again, to, uh, to go through the process of uh, enacting a rule. And uh, let's face it, our country is now on a, a very high state of alert and we can't afford to wait uh, another three years to get aviation security technology or screening standards uh, in place. Witnesses at our uh, hearings uh, that we held on the problem of uh, cutting through the red tape and enacting security rules on an expedited basis uh, shared some uh, stories uh, with us about the time it takes for different uh, rules. For example, the emergency exit rule took 10 years uh, uh, to process. The child safety restraint, restraint rule ha has taken over three years and still isn't finished. And finally, the flight simulator uh, rules took 13 years. Often an agency will place the blame uh, for the time it takes to pass a rule on the time it takes to study the issue, analyze the cost uh, benefit da data, publish the rule, gather public com uh, comments, and incorporate those comments, and finally send the proposed uh, rule to the Office of uh, uh, Management and Budget for their approval. That also often takes uh, a good deal of time. However, the layers of review and analysis have become impediments that are, in fact, hindering our ability to achieve a secure aviation environment particularly in a time of national crisis. Perhaps the rule that's received the very most attention recently has been the rule requiring screening companies to be certified to ensure that they were meeting uh, minimum sta standards of uh, performance. Sadly, despite the Gore Commission recommendations, and uh, the Gore Commission uh, uh, after uh, TWA 800 and uh, uh, Oklahoma City bombings uh, uh, acted and uh, recommended action. Uh, and two congressional laws, one in 1996 and another in the year 2000, the uh, FAA, in fact, dallied for six years on the screening uh, rule, which was still not in place. Uh, standards, again, for screeners were still not in place. A rule not was not enacted by September 11th of this year. It's absolutely critical the administration uh, get the right employees uh, to be screeners and uh, also that we set up a rational uh, personnel uh, system. Uh, again, we've given unprecedented uh, authority in uh, the aviation security law uh, for this new uh, transportation czar to have uh, almost unprecedented hiring, uh, firing, uh, discipline uh, authority over this new class of uh, federal workers. 
The major complaint that we often hear about federal employees has been the impossibility of, of uh, disciplining them. I chaired for four years the uh, Civil Service uh, Subcommittee in the House of Representatives. Uh, we found some interesting things in looking at the performance uh, of uh, federal employees. Federal employees' complaints take on average 3.5 years to resolve. Uh, we must be able to uh, enact performance measures, uh, and if this is uh, done by a rule uh, and, and it does affect uh, our security uh, performance uh, uh, as it relates to our most important assets, and that's uh, human uh, workers, but we must be able to enact performance measures in a meaningful manner, something that has been resisted in the past. Twice in the House I passed uh, performance-based management systems for our civil service system, and twice uh, they were defeated or not taken up in the uh, other uh, body. Um, and in fact, I let the uh, employees uh, groups help draft uh, uh, the provisions of those uh, standards. We cannot have security tangled in the normal bureaucratic red tape and employee protections that have been chiseled in stone over many uh, years. The, the new undersecretary's unprecedented rulemaking authority should not only provide impetus on getting the right standards uh, for screeners and these new uh, federal workers, but should also uh, give them the ability to put the, the most cutting edge technologies in our airports immediately. That was uh, part of the purpose of the way we crafted the legislation. Again, while technology exists, uh, which could have detected the plastic knives uh, that uh, we believe were used on September 11th, or could detect other uh, plastic weapons, it has not yet been deployed at our nation's airports. To approve new technology can in fact take months. To complete acquisition or deploy the latest security technology can unfortunately take years. I know there are other areas uh, which the new Undersecretary will will find this, again, unprecedented rulemaking authority critical. But I'm convinced that just uh, by uh, getting the right technology in place and the standards are set for screeners, again, high standards we've been seeking for many years, will have made great progress in our transportation, in making our transportation uh, system much more secure and making the uh, traveling public uh, much more confident. I hope uh, today that your subcommittee will exam examine carefully the torturous and time-consuming process required to pass simple rules related to security requirements. On September 11th, above all else, the rulemaking process failed. It failed to allow new rules for technology approval and deployment. It failed to identify new security risks and adopt new standards by expedited uh, rulemaking. We cannot, as a matter of normal course of uh, our uh, conduct of the business of government, allow red tape and bureaucratic delays to hinder the rulemaking process, particularly when it comes to matters of national and aviation uh, security. Finally, let me just say one thing, and it's not in uh, this uh, prepared statement, but the rules and even laws need to be realistic and they need to be uh, flexible. Uh, we did put provisions in this law that we just passed, unfortunately, that uh, I believe are not realistic. The 60-day baggage uh, screening uh, provision, which we put by law, uh, is not, uh, uh, is not uh, realistic. And I think today or uh, Shortly, the administration will announce that they can't meet that provision that we, in fact, put in law. So our uh, rules, uh, even if they're expedited and uh, put uh, into place on an unprecedented uh, cut through the red tape basis as we've provided for, have to be realistic. And secondly, they need to be uh, flexible, uh, flexible enough so that we don't uh, tie the hands of those who are deploying uh, the latest technology, those who are deploying the most uh, uh, highly skilled uh, workforce, uh, those that are involved in putting, again, these other uh, uh, necessary procedures in place that we give them uh, flexibility. 
For those comments, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Micah. Appreciate you coming. I know that you've worked hard on this bill. I have a couple of questions I'd like to follow up on. Before I do, I want to recognize Congressman Shays having joined us. I appreciate you coming. Um, on the issue of the rulemaking process at DOT, there was a law we passed in 2000 mandating the FAA to come forward with some new requirements, and you have correctly highlighted that inability to get to conclusion. In the context of what FAA was required to do, would that have had an effect on anything that occurred on September 11th? Well, I believe uh, it probably would have. Uh, I, I think in my testimony I have pointed out that uh, you have to adopt rules or regulations uh, that, uh, that can identify, uh, for example, in the aviation security area, the most vulnerable risks we're at, and then be able to act on them. We're so bogged down in bureaucratic red tape, it takes us so long to get in place even standards for a screening uh, uh, company that um, uh, the larger picture is lost in this. Uh, one of the first things I did in February was, uh, when I took over the aviation subcommittee was bring in the new head of, uh, of uh, security for FAA. And we tried to talk about the big picture, but they, they spend most of their time mired in trying to pass these rules uh, in this torturous process that we've described. And uh, you lose sight of the big picture, you lose sight of where the risks may uh, be. Could uh, the events of September 11th uh, been prevented? Possibly. We have equipment, uh, we have technology that has been tested uh, that will, in fact, uh, identify plastic weapons, uh, and we believe knives were used. Uh, there was no rule in place to ban box cutters. If someone had looked at the potential risk, uh, possibly we could have had an expedited rule uh, that would have uh, banned uh, box cutters or looked again at the, the larger picture. But we certainly could have had equipment in place on September 11th that would detect the type of weapons that were used but again, the torturous process of getting this deployed, and you get everybody and their brother in, involved in this process. Even a few weeks ago, the ACLU was protesting uh, the possibility of us, us getting some of this uh, uh, technology deployed that um, it is very high in its definition and felt it was a, a personal intrusion uh, uh, into uh, passengers or citizens. The gentleman from El Al, who will testify later, having reviewed his remarks, indicated that the two questions that are typically, typically asked of a traveler right now, did you pack your bag and you had it in control? Totally, totally useless. I just had them ask me as I got on a plane on the way here. I think you'll have a representative from El Al. They, and uh, they testified before our subcommittee. Uh, I don't know who came up with that particular provision, but it doesn't do the job. They need to ask more uh, specific questions, probably on a limited basis and maybe on a profile basis. My God, little old ladies in a wheelchair I just saw, you know, that are being wand are not taking down airplanes. We know specifically the types that are taking uh, down uh, airplanes. Um, so uh, we spent all this time being politically correct and trying to get even basic rules and uh, place uh, which which have been impossible uh, sounds uh, like a little a little bit like we're uh, self-defeating how about the in that same testimony there was there were comments highlighting the fact that we match baggage to passengers mm -hmm. for instance on planes in Europe coming to the United States or as El Al does matching bags to baggage bags to passenger on every flight does that well, we've, done, we've done most of that uh, in the past, uh, restricted to international flights. But the events of September 11th uh, indicate that we're in a new ball game. When someone's willing to take down, down a plane and be on the plane and direct the plane into a target, 
whether you match the bag or not is sort of a moot point. So we may be wasting a lot of uh, money. We tried to shy away in our legislation from requiring match baggage, but some people think that match baggage is uh, the answer to security problems. Personally, I don't think it is. One of the, one of the themes that I discern from your comments are that the, there is a trade-off here between security and perhaps some loss of privacy. Does the law that we have just passed give the Secretary the ability to issue regulations that implement that trade-off? Well, uh, we're so accustomed to personal freedoms and uh, uh, trying to keep government out of our lives and out of our business or personal affairs, and, and that's appropriate. When it comes to issues of national security, when you have someone that w is willing, again, to to die to take down uh, a plane and passengers and thousands of uh, people on the ground, uh, we have to balance uh, that with, uh, with uh, our security needs. So we have to protect uh, uh, privacy, but uh, and we tried to do that in the legislation that we passed. But again, this new uh, undersecretary, transportation czar, I could, the only one I can think of that has the power that that individual has uh, in, in uh, any provisions of law would be the President of the United States. Now, the rulemaking ability of the new transportation czar is very narrowed. It's, uh, it's confined to transportation uh, security and aviation security, so he, he or she is not going to be out doing all these kinds of things that will <coughs> invade people's privacy. I hope they'll be respected. And we do have a checkoff in the, the, the bill that we passed uh, with a panel made up of our chief law enforcement agencies, one representative from Attorney General's office, uh, the different uh, uh, Department of Treasury and others involved in law enforcement, where uh, a rule could be overridden by that panel. So we have some protections in there, but it's something we always have to be on guard. I thank the gentleman. Gentleman from Massachusetts. I have no questions. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Gentleman from Connecticut. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing, and uh, thank you, Ranking Member. I, um, uh, Mr. Mike, uh, have been uh, uh, very impressed, uh, as have your other colleagues, with the job you've done in airport security. I am puzzled by one provision. In the amendment that we put in in the House on uh, checking baggage for explosives, there we had at the end of the year 2003 because we knew there would be a task of getting equipment and also having space for some of the equipment. And in the House bill, I was pleased that it was moved up to the end of two, year 2002. I'm unclear as to the provision that says deadline for all checked baggage to be screened by some method within 60 days. Right. Explain that provision. Well, again, that provision was put in the legislation trying to, to get deployed. In, um, as you may know, in the past, uh, after each of these uh, incidents uh, and, and tragedies, uh, we try to cobble together legislative provisions or attack the problem. After TWA 800 and uh, also Oklahoma City, all the emphasis was placed on explosive detection devices. We went out and bought $443 million worth of explosive detective de detection devices. Some of that equipment was good, some of it wasn't uh, and, and worked, some of it didn't work. Uh, some of it was deployed, some of it was not deployed. In the past, the airlines had the responsibility before the President signed the law on November 19th of actually uh, conducting the security procedures. They, they uh, employed the personnel, the screeners and the people who also did the uh, uh, the work with these explosive detection devices. They also could tell, in fact, the security chief who came in and uh, talked to me said that some of the airlines told him basically to go take a hike. They weren't going to use this equipment. It, it, it slowed things down. It cost money. They didn't want to do it. But we had no way of enforcing that they used it. So the provision we put in the law was uh, basically uh, to deploy any of the equipment that's sitting idle, to put in place any means possible, uh, dogs uh, probably, uh, dog sniffing, uh, dog sniffing, 
dogs could uh, do as probably as good a job as some of the equipment, or other equipment, or maybe some spot check baggage. So that was a directive to try to get these things in place. Can it be done in 60 days? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think could I, could I just the intent was good, but I don't think. Well, see, I'm not even understanding the intent. Let me just be clear. By the end of 2002. Well, 2002 is well, a let different me, let date. Let me just ask my question, so just so I can structure it in a way. You, you know so much about this bill, you want to tell me more than I want to know. <laughs> I just want to know, by the end of 2002, they have to be totally complete. Uh, all baggage will be screened for explosives. Is, is that correct? That's right. OK. The, the 60 days, th there's a news account that says uh, Secretary Mineta said it's unlikely to meet the toughest deadline in the aviation security law President Bush just signed, that all checked and carry-on baggage be screened for explosives within 60 days. We don't require that all baggage be sc screened for explosives in, in 60 days. We do not now, right. Yeah. And we won't be able to and, in and, 60 and, days. We tried we, to explain this to some of our colleagues, too. No, 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 you know, but, no but it, we didn't. Are you saying we have a 60-day requirement that all bills have to, all luggage? Yes. So we have. Well, it's, the intent was, again, the intent was to deploy everything we have, every means we have uh, uh, possible, technology that we have possible, dogs, uh, some searches, maybe okay. using the so National Guard I just want you to define the 60 days. I mean, technically, the, the bill requires it. Technically, the bill requires it. Practically, and that's part of what I spoke in the end of my test of testimony, we need to be realistic and we well, need to be flexible, whether it's a law or whether it's a rule. I don't mind being realistic. I want us to be realistic. I just want us to understand. You're saying, I, and I want you to put it in clear terms, you're saying basically the bill has a contradiction, that we say 60 days at all explosives and we say two years all explosives? Mm -hmm. Well, again, it started out as an intent to try to deploy everything possible within 60 days the, and 60 take every provision we could uh, or ever, t take every action we could to uh, ensure that uh, as much baggage that was checked was screened. And then it turned into more of a, a mandate uh, without flexibility. The true mandate in there is the one that you worked on that was originally 2003 and got moved to two, December of 2002. That's in the bill. It, it is achievable. There are some problems even with that requirement. And you'll hear that either from other witnesses or people who are involved in uh, producing the uh, technology. Yeah. I'll, I'll try to track down the, the, the language before we have our next panel on the 60 days. I just want to be clear on this one point. Would the gentleman uh, yield? I have the language. Pardon me? I have the language. Okay. You want to read it to me? Uh, the language on the 60-day requirement is a system must be in operation to screen all checked baggage at all airports in the United States as soon as practicable, but not later than the 60th day following the date of enactment of the Aviation and Transportation Security Act. Okay, now that's, it doesn't say explosives there. It just says check all baggage, correct? Correct. Then there's an insert on page 49 as it relates to explosive detection systems that says explosive detection systems are deployed as soon as possible to ensure that all United States airports described in section 44903C have sufficient explosive detection systems to screen all checked baggage no later than December 31st, 2002 and that as soon as such systems are in place at an airport, okay. all checked baggage at the airport so, is screened so, by those so systems. So when I'm hearing this language, it says explosives by the end of 2002, a system that checks for all, and, it, and, and in the 60 day, it says all baggage will be checked. It doesn't specifically uh, highlight the issue of explosives, correct? Well, it's, a, it's again, a directive. Yeah. Um, and so, it's, is it, is it, Possible to put systems in place? Yes. Will the systems work to cover 100 percent? No. Not in 60 days. No way, Jose. I understand. It does not say explosives in 60 days. That's all. Right. I, yeah, that's all I'm saying. I mean, it, it, I, it, the it other problem we had in uh, testifying before us, uh, Mr. Shays and members of the panel, is that uh, even by the time we deploy some of the technology that can detect explosive devices, 
the material that's used for explosives is changing. So if we gave them two years to deploy uh, uh, technology, the material that can be used as explosive may change and we may not have available the, uh, in place the technology that can in fact detect these new explosives by changing the chemical composition or the makeup of the, the bomb device or explosive device. Yeah, I'll just That's the scary part about all of this. Well, it, it, the, the bottom line is if we can't check for explosives in the belly of an aircraft, we can't say that airline travel is safe. But again, if and, you and, can... And so it's important mm -hmm. that we begin this task immediately. It, there will, it, it will not be uh, foolproof. But I don't read the legislation that we are supposed to have in place within 60 days a system to check for all explosive material. But I do read in the legislation that by the end of the year 2002, we must do it. And obviously, uh, the administration is going to work overtime to accomplish that task. And it may have to come back and say we're not meeting it or not meeting it. But in the course of trying to reach that deadline, I make an assumption that six months into this, that a good number of the bags will be screened for explosive devices, not all. And, and, and I realize that we, we don't want to buy equipment that doesn't work, but I just want to reemphasize the 60 days is not uh, explosive material, as this story seems to imply, and I'm kind of disappointed it's, it's becoming an issue so quickly with Minetta saying we can't do it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Shays. Do you have anything else? Mr. Micah, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wish you well, and we have staff here who are listening to the proceedings. We appreciate your uh, conducting complete oversight, um, I, again, on this most important uh, issue, and I encourage you to continue this process, and we'll work uh, with your subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Okay, we'll have the second panel join us now. I'm going to say who they are. The second panel is comprised of Isaac Yeffett, Edward Merlis, and Todd Hopley. Gentlemen, in this in this subcommittee, we swear our all. We swore all our witnesses, so if you'd uh, please rise. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The records show the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. Our first witness on the second panel is Isaac Yeffett. He is the former director of security for El Al Airline. Welcome. You we have your, I want to caution the witnesses, we have your written statements, and I, I know that everybody up here has read them. Uh, I have a heavy gavel at five minutes. The green light shows you are in the first four minutes. The yellow light shows you are in the last minute, and the red light means that the trap door underneath your chair opens and you're finished. So for five minutes, Mr. Yeffert. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the subcommittee, I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify here about the aviation security of the United States of America, and especially the changes that should be made sooner or better to upgrade the level of security to a degree where any enemy who will try in the future to hijack or to blow up any aircraft of our country, American air carriers, will fail. This is on air and on the ground if they will come to attack and to kill our passengers on the ground at any terminal in the world and especially out of these countries of this country, we have to make sure 
that the enemy will get the answer from our guys in a second, and they will pay with their life and not any more American people. For this changes, there are a few conditions that in my belief, we cannot reach this goal if we don't change the system and the concept of the FEA, the FAA. We cannot continue so many years to rely only on technology, on machinery. This technology failed so many times. If it's by the test that the FAA have made or when real happened to us by the enemies or by mistakes that people were, carry, were carrying gun and nothing would uh, stop them on the security checkpoint. It's time to understand that machinery can help the qualified and well-trained human being and not to replace them. Since September 11, we are witnesses to so many times that we failed in our security checkpoint when statement after statement was made that now we have a very high level of security and it's safe to fly with American air carriers when in reality nothing has been changed. I flew enough times since September 11. I didn't see any changes. And I cannot tell the American people, yes, we are safe when we are not safe. This morning, I took flight from Newark Airport to Regan Airport. The ticket agent behind the counter asked me two questions without looking at my eyes when I am answering the, 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 uh, the, the questions. I decided to talk to her to tell her that I am a security of an airline. And why did you ask me these two silly questions when you didn't even pay attention to my answers? And she said, we never were trained what to do. We only were told to ask questions and whatever you answer me, you answer me, sir. I said, don't you think that you are making joke from the security? She looked at me and she said, you know, I was hired to do my job as a ticket agent, not as a security. I'm not expert in security. When we bought the aircraft, we have heard an announcement that we have to remain seated on our seat from gate to gate, and we cannot move during the flight. This is only a result of being failures when it comes to the aviation security of our country. Passengers should not, should not suffer because the lack of security. It's in our hand to change this system. The FAA charges millions of dollars every year, the airlines. For so many times, the security people at the security checkpoint failed. But they never said, stop here. Money is important, life is more important. And therefore, we want to know why so many times 
our system fails once after once and why we still keep this security company running the security at our airports. We know about security huge company that hired a year ago something like close to this security people with criminal record. They were caught and they made settlement. Pay us fine, $1.6 million, and don't do it again. Recently, they were caught again. Mr. Jaffa, we're, we're going to come back to your testimony here because I think you've got such a wealth of knowledge that I'm sure that. Can you allow me one more sentence, please? Yes. Okay. My last sentence is that if we want to succeed in having a high level of security, we must match the passenger with his luggage at the terminal before he is heading to the check-in. We must interview every passenger by qualified and well-trained security people. American people and permanent resident with green card, they have to come with a government ID. All others that are not citizens and are not permanent residents, they must come with passport. Every tourist should come with his passport, and the security people will check the passport to find out from what nationality the man is, what kind of visas he has, is the visa he has expired, this is fake or real passport that he is carrying. Based on this, we can build enough security questions to determine if this passenger is suspicious or bona fide. But by the fact that I've heard from Mr. Micah that he doesn't believe that to match the luggage to the passenger will not help us. This will not help us if we will not interview the passengers. And we need to do it because through the passengers, we come to the explosive and to the weapon inside the luggage. The luggage cannot talk, cannot tell us what is the contents inside the luggage. The passenger will give us the answer. And if we are professionals and we know how to ask the right questions and we look at the eyes of the passenger, we can determine who is bona fide and who is not. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Giafai. Mr. Merlos. Thank you. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the sub subcommittee. I'm Edward Merlos, Senior Vice President of the Air Transport Association of America. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the transition regulations flowing from last week's enactment of the Aviation and Transportation Security Act. We're very pleased that Congress and the administration have reached consensus on this legislation that will place the federal government in control of aviation security, a position we've advocated since at least 1973. We've long felt that airlines do not belong in the security and law enforcement business. We move passengers and goods efficiently, and we should focus on that job. Government, on the other hand, not only has the authority, but also the societal responsibility to provide security protection for our customers, our airlines, and the nation they serve. Why have we felt that government has absolute preeminence in aviation security? Simply stated, aviation security and the fight against terrorism starts with the deployment of our nation's intelligence gathering and analysis resources. Once our intelligence apparatus determines where the threat lies, we must utilize the proper tools to combat terrorism. Fundamentally, there are six tools that can be used to remedy the problems identified by our intelligence assets. The tools are diplomacy, economic sanctions, military intervention, covert action, law enforcement, and countermeasures. The first five are exclusively governmental authorities, functions far beyond this industry or any industry's abilities. In these areas, we need the full-scale participation of the FBI, the CIA, and a host of other government agencies which have the wherewithal to fulfill those obligations. Unfortunately, for too long, the airlines have been delegated by government to take charge of aviation security. The airline industry does not have the expertise, much less the right, to engage in any of the essential activities necessary to combat terrorism. Airlines are not law enforcement or national defense agencies. 
As a result, too much of our aviation security effort was devoted to countermeasures, the last line of defense, an important line of defense, no less, but in concert only with the preceding five authorities once they've been deployed. In essence, we have been essentially ignoring the best lines of defense and relying only on the last. <clears throat> Thus, we view last week's enactment of the Aviation and Transportation Security Act as the fulfillment of what should have been done long ago, putting the government in full control of aviation security. Mr. Chairman, the hearing focuses on regulatory requirements emanating from the enactment of the uh, Aviation and Transportation Security Act, and I've enumerated uh, five different provisions in the act which we feel are particularly important as they apply to the airline industry. We're committed to working with the Transportation Security Administration in implementing these requirements so that, that the vision of the Congress can become a reality. In each case, we have some measure of experience and offer that up for the TSA's consideration. But we recognize that in the end, the TSA is the responsible party that must issue the regulations and implement a comprehensive aviation security program. One area I'd like to focus on briefly is the use of intelligence data. Much of the attention in the legislation is focused on looking for things among the billions of bags, packages, and people we carry. We would hope that in the interest of erecting a better aviation security barrier, much more is done to utilize existing sources of data to, in effect, look at the people involved and decide on that basis where to focus our screening efforts. That needle in the haystack can be found if the haystack is small enough, but not so long as the haystack stretches beyond the horizon. We believe that better utilization of intelligence and law enforcement resources is the key to that goal, as well as to the specific requirements of Section 138, the background check provision. What we envision is a dynamic process through which real-time communication of our reservation systems and the government's databases are put to best use. Airlines do not need to know who is on a government list, but the government surely needs to know that people on their hot lists are planning to travel. Through the efficient use of this data, security attention can be focused on where it can be of highest utility. Aviation security is the process of finding the one person out of hundreds of millions of passengers who intends to do harm. Government can best do that, and we are prepared to work with government to ensure that it is accomplished. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Merlis. Our third witness is Todd Hopley, who is the Senior Vice President for Legislative Affairs for the American Association of Airport Executives and the Airports Council International North America. Welcome. You Mr. Chairman, thank five you. Minutes. It's good to be with you again, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Tierney, Mr. Shays. Uh, I have four points that I'd like to try and make uh, in my oral testimony. First is talk about funding. The second, talk about the new Transportation Security Administration. The third, talk about screeners. And then finally, the use of technology. Uh, on the issue of funding, airports in the immediate aftermath of the events of September 11th were required by the FAA to deploy additional law enforcement personnel throughout the airports. That's been something that airports have done. It's been an extremely expensive requirement, an extremely expensive federal mandate that airports are complying with. The legislation that Congress enacted authorizes but does not appropriate funds for reimbursement for law enforcement officials. That's something we'll continue to work with. Mr. Chairman, I picked a very random airport to illustrate the point. I just grabbed one out of the hat, and it happened to be Sacramento. Uh, in that instance, Your testimony says Cedar Rapids. Now. Well, <clears throat> we modified that by for the oral presentation, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Um, in Sacramento, we've spent uh, three million dollars on additional law enforcement officers. At the same time that the Sacramento airport will spend and will lose five million dollars in revenues from lost concession revenues, parking revenues, and the like. Mr. Tierney, uh, another semi-random example, at Boston Logan Airport, they will spend an additional $10 million this year for law enforcement requirements and lose probably $75 million in revenues. Uh, additionally, airports are going to need help uh, with the capital requirements of terminal redesign, um, and we're going to have to look at how we uh, queue passengers in screening lines, where we're going to put them, where we're going to put these explosive detection systems. They're heavy pieces of equipment that need reinforcement in the infrastructure. All of that is going to cause us to get need additional resources. 
With the creation of the Transportation Security Administration, that will require government and industry to work cooperatively like they've never done before. There are, the legislation is replete with requirements for the TSA to come up with new things in 60 days, 90 days, 120 days, 180 days, within two years, within one year. We need to make sure that government and industry are working together. While we recognize the point Mr. Micah made earlier about the vast authority given the undersecretary to promulgate rules without um, comment from outside groups, we hope that um, vast power is used sparingly. We believe it's necessary to work with the government in the promulgation of those rules. Third point on screeners, the airport groups were relatively agnostic during this debate as to who should sign the paycheck, whether that be a federal employee or not. But we felt very strongly, and due to this day, that there needs to be improved screening, improved training, improved proficiency for those screeners. We think that the provision in the law that allows airport, excuse me, um, allows airports to opt out of the federal screeners come after a two-year period, combined with the fact that those class of federal employees may be removed or fired, gives airports important leverage that we don't have now, say, with INS or with customs or with agriculture uh, inspectors. That gives, I think, pressure, that puts pressure on the TSA and on the screeners to make sure that they are doing a good job because they may lose their jobs if they don't. And we think that's an important provision that Congress put in. Finally, on the use of technology, the legislation calls for a pilot program on access control for up to 20 airports. We believe that's important so that we can experiment with different biometric um, models to determine what might be the best um, course to take in the future. Also, we think it's important to explore the possibility of using smart credentials, smart cards, the possibility of using passports. There are 65 million passports in the system today. Um, that may jumpstart us in our ability to, as, as Mr. Merlis pointed out, take that haystack and make it smaller. If you've got to find the needle in the haystack, the best way of doing that is making the haystack smaller. Uh, El Al uses a system, a trusted traveler system, where you um, are subjected to interviews um, and background checks initially if you're a frequent traveler. And if you obtain a card, you are allowed to essentially bypass a portion of the screening process that takes the screening, the security screening time down from several hours in many instances down to as little as 15 to 20 minutes. That's something that we should explore in the future using technology to help some of the problems that we've experienced to date. With that, I'll yield back and respond to questions. Thank you, Mr. Hopley. I want to just go through a series of questions here, and I'm going to ask each of you for your response. Brevity is appreciated. Mr. Yafat, from your standpoint, from your experience, the interview process is integral to establishing security. Is that correct? That's correct. Mr. Merlis, does the ATA agree with that? Absolutely. We Mr. want to look for people, not things. Mr. Hopley? Interviews are very important, yes. Okay. Second question. Is there a trade-off that is necessary to be made and accepted here in America between providing an adequate level of security and, re and being able to fly? In other words, should the American people just come to expect that one of the consequences of providing security is that they may be asked a series of questions that might some might consider intrusive. Is that a necessary trade-off? Mr. Chairman, I interviewed during the last 15 years in this country so many passengers, and we discussed together about their convenience, if we can ask them the questions and they will give us the answer for their safety. The problem is how we approach to the passenger to explain to him why we have to ask 
the security questions. This is for your safety. You take the flight, we stay on ground, and therefore, please cooperate with us that we will make sure that you will fly safe and secure. Not even one told me, I don't care, I don't want to answer any questions, I don't care about my life or my children's life. Everybody said, please do it. Number two, after September 11th, Mr. Chairman, the world has been changed, not only the United States of America, and everyone will love to cooperate with the security instead of being tortured when he goes to the security checkpoint or when he takes flight. I flew to Denver and I told my colleagues, I want to make sure now that I will make the alarm goes off. I want to see what will happen. I did it. First step. I was told, take, out, take off your shoes. I said, why do you want my shoes? We think we found what you have, what we are looking for. I said, take my shoes. Like me, another 15 passengers were waiting without shoes for 10 minutes until they came to us and they gave us the, back the shoes, but they forgot from which part of my body the alarms went off. This was not important. The shoes has to be taken off. In New York, announcement of the security people at checkpoint. They said, everyone, that the alarm will go off, he has to take off his shoes. So help me God, people next to me with boots were afraid to death. They took off the shoes and they placed it on the on the x-ray machine. This is not the security that we want. We cannot be paranoid. We cannot be in panic. We cannot overreact. After September 11, we eliminated, the FAA eliminated the sky cap. Two, two weeks later, they are back. This is not a system. This is not a concept. The American people, they will love to cooperate if they, if they will understand and they will be convinced that we do it for their safety. Does the ATA share that? Absolutely. But as I said, we keep doing this, this what I was one step removed from harassment, instead of focusing <coughs> on people who are potential hazards and dangers to us. We, we take knitting needles away from grandmothers when in the history of terrorism, there's never been a female over a certain age, and not using those efforts and time and energy to focus on the potential terrorist and doing a strip search if necessary of that individual. Mr. Hopley, how about the airport executives and the airport operators? Right. On the continuum between absolute safety and absolute convenience, clearly our mark has moved since September 11th, and I think uh, everyone would agree that additional questions is just fine at this point. So if I could synthesize your comments, you're all in agreement that the regulations that might be adopted on an interim or emergency basis should provide for the opportunity to do interviews? Yes. That's correct, sir. And this is the best opportunity for the security people to check passport of non-American citizens and, and permanent residents with green card to see who is coming to take the flight with us what kind of passport he has. Okay. Is he legal in the country or is he illegal in the country? Is the, purple, the passport is real or it's fake? This okay. is the best opportunity for the country, not only for the airline security, to find out if there are any passengers that are illegal here, that are suspicious, that we get any suspicious sign from the ticket office and the reservation department of the airlines. And I'm very sorry to say that I'm not happy with the new law that was signed by the president because I don't believe that we have to release the airlines from the responsibility of their security. They run their, uh, the, uh, the flight 
Every flight, they are responsible for their operation from A to Z. Okay, we're going to come back to that question in a minute. Mr. Hopley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to make one point. I, I agreed that, yes, uh, interviews were important. I think it's also important to remember that in a system of ours with 700 million passengers, it is not likely that we are going to be able to interview every passenger every time um, and have that work <coughs> with the current system that we have in terms of moving people through the system in an efficient fashion. So there needs to be some balance in how we approach that, which was why I earlier addressed the notion of for frequent travelers, the idea of getting a smart card or some kind of um, traveler card where you would be subjected to rigorous interviews initially, go through background checks, and then be able to go through an expedited process uh, for frequent travelers, and then for the occasional travelers, go through a more um, involved process. We need to do something like that to use technology because we move in two days the number of passengers that El Al moves in an entire year. We'll come back to the level of tolerance that we might be willing to accept. Mr. Tierney, for five minutes. Thank you. Let me just start by saying, uh, you know, today's a frequent traveler that's trusted maybe tomorrow's compromised traveler. And I don't, at some other point, we can talk about how you get over that. I think is that whenever anybody talks about making somebody special and put them to the front of the line, I wonder what makes them special forever because things do change, people get compromised. But, uh, Mr. Merlis, you, know, you indicated that the, the airline industry has said that they've always wanted security to be a government responsibility, but uh, how can you give us assurance that the industry uh, is going to abandon what I think has been its historical reluctance, if not its outright opposition, uh, to putting security really ahead of the convenience of the passenger or the, or the customer? On that, because I really think that that has been a, a key to a, a lot of things, that, that whether it's matching the bags or whether it's asking the right questions or whether it's completing a baggage check. Uh, I think that the airlines have had for a long time historically been reluctant to really uh, do that to the extent that it ought to be done. And now I see them all jumping over to have the government uh, take over on that. But how, what assurances if the government takes it over that you're not just going to abandon uh, any responsibility or any efforts on the part of the airline industry itself? Let me say first that the questions are asked not because we wanted to, the government prescribed them. Secondly, if we pursued those questions, we might run severe risks uh, of, of violating civil liberties. There have been certain airlines which have been sued repeatedly when they were suspicious of people and did not have good cause because they're not law enforcement. Were there provisions types. that the, are you aware of any provisions that the airlines uh, would have implemented uh, but for their fear that the government would have disallowed their implementation? Well, going back eight, ten years, carriers asked certain questions, treated people sometimes differently and got sued, so they just said, well, just ask what we're asked to. But to and that's whether or not they won or lost the suit? Excuse me? I mean, did they win or lose those suits? Uh, I believe they settled. They were human rights suits in New York City, and you just settle those. You don't, you don't go all the way to litigation. You don't go all the way you to trial. It, but in but response I mean, to your question, What stopped them sir, from, you know, from checking baggage? What stopped them from matching bags? What stopped them from, from doing all the things that make common sense in light of uh, September 11th? Well, in light of September 11th, we do not believe that 100 percent bag match is the right way. We think you should screen 100 percent of the bags. I think that's far more efficient. Why wouldn't you also want to match the bags? I mean, you're assuming then that everybody's su uh, only suicidal people are the ones we're concerned about? No, I think that the way to do security is a layered approach. You use a lot of different things, not the same thing on every single person. If you have something that does the same thing on every single person, sooner or later your adversary is going to figure it out and figure out a way to pierce it. What you want to have is a variety of different kinds of tools that you use so that they never know what you're up to. You Why might didn't do the airlines do that five. before September 11th? What did the airlines do Why before? Why didn't they do these things? Airlines didn't do some of those things. Well, they didn't do them all, and they didn't do it all well enough, right? Well, sir, there was nothing about any of those individuals who got through who, uh, who violated any security requirement. Yet, at the same time, we know that many of those names were in government intelligence files and never been provided to the airlines. That gets to Mr. Yeffett's question. If the government has the information and says, look for Joe, we'll look for him. But we don't know who Joe is. And, uh, and I think that that's the first step in the process. Once you identify who the person is, then let's do everything possible with those people to ensure that they are not a threat. Maybe right. what you do with those is after you search their bags and do a strip search, and then you do a bag match on those people. 
uh, or maybe you don't even let them fly on the flight they've scheduled just because you're their suspect. But uh, I think that the question you ask is, well, will we abandon anything? We will do what's required under the law, and what's required under the law is caps and bag match. We are relieved of uh, screening. We're not supposed to do screening subsequent to the 90-day uh, provision, but we do whatever we're asked to do by the government in this case. Thank you. Mr. Hopley, uh, just to clarify one thing, you made mention of some of the additional personnel that have been placed at airports. Yes, sir. Um, and I guess it, uh, as a one-time cost, I, I can see your point, but if these are things that should have been done as the security measures for which the airports were responsible at any rate, uh, am I correct in saying that you're not asking for the federal government to pick up that ongoing cost on a regular basis? You just want to have to pick up the one-time cost for the fact that it wasn't done and, and all of a sudden had to be done and wasn't accounted for? That's right, sir. We're looking for reimbursement for the security cost that airports had to assume as a result of FAA mandates, new right. security And am I assuming, though, that you want it for that one time that, that you were on your own right, whether you be an airport um, authority or whether you be a state that runs the airport or whether a municipality or whatever, are going to change their level of security personnel anyway and then be responsible for that themselves on their own Yes, budgets. sir. We're looking, in the future, we're also looking to try and figure out how to pay for some of these increased ongoing costs, but that's a uh, story for another day. Okay. Uh, and Mr. Yeffert, let me just ask you that I would assume that uh, you're not happy with check-in people or the, uh, the airlines not looking at you in your eye, you're talking, then you have a rather low opinion of the new computer check-in system where you get to punch a number that says uh, the answer to those two questions and maybe the money would be better spent uh, just training those personnel as opposed to computerizing and, and putting those computer systems in. Do you see any future use at all for those computer check-in machines? I don't know why we have to use them at all. Let's assume that I am terrorist, and the um, computer will ask me the question when I buy the electronic ticket, and I will punch that I am terrorist. What will happen? It's a shame that we still, after so many times that we suffered and we lost thousands of lives of innocent people. We're still working with the concept that it's totally wrong and the, we don't stop it. The FAA eliminated the sky cap, but they kept the, the electronic ticket exactly. to be operated. If the sky cap were, were dangerous, so why you brought them back after two weeks? If they are not dangerous, so why you kick them out? They need to, to eat, they need to work. Keep them, tell them, do not deal with security. Help the passenger bringing the luggage to the check-in, to the security people, whoever, but don't eliminate them. The problem with the FAA, unfortunately, and I see it since 1986, we act and then we think. I remember 1986, US Air aircraft flew from LA to San Diego. At that time, the FAA decided all air crew members and airlines employees with uniform can bypass the security checkpoint. Why? Because they wanted this. A guy who used to work for US Air stole money from the company and he was caught, he was fired. No one took from him the badge and the uniform. He asked for compensation and he was ignored. He said in his letter to his boss, I am drug user, I am alcoholist, help me with the money. He was ignored. One day he found out that his boss is taking the flight from LA to San Diego. He took a gun, he put on his uniform with a badge, he bought a ticket, he bypassed the security checkpoint. Close to San Diego, he wrote a note to his boss, I left with nothing, you will have nothing, and opened fire, and the aircraft was crashed, and all the passengers were killed. I was hired to do the investigation at that time, and I asked the FAA, what happened? Why? It was a mistake, now we change it. 
before September 11, knife of four inches that you can kill a cow with it. It was legal to board the, the, the aircraft. And suddenly after September 11, nail clipper is, is, is illegal. Where we are going to? Let's use our brain and not our emotion. If people cannot decide properly when it comes to life of American people, they should not stay in their position. The American people trust us. Do not disappoint them. And don't do mistake after mistake. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Mr. Shays. I don't use this word very often. Um, I don't like to think that I get frustrated, but I, I, I'm listening to this testimony, and I'm getting more frustrated than I ever thought I would. Because, Mr. Yeffett, you, you bring your world to this, and it's different than what I think my world is, and each of you have your own different perspectives. I don't see how the damn system works. I don't see how the system works where I would want to fly uh, for a whole host of reasons. I, I want safety. Uh, I care about cost somewhat, and I don't want to wait in an airport for three hours to go on a two-hour trip. I mean, I might as well walk. And so I'm thinking to myself, uh, well, I, I, I'm pretty sure of one thing, and maybe it's not a bad thing. I don't think airline traffic is going to double in the next 10 years like we thought. So I don't think we have to worry about congestion at airports. Um, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we need to think about using some other mode of transportation. But um, of these 19 terrorists, 17 were legal. They got into the country legally. They were legal. Um, and I want to know, would all uh, of the 19 have been interviewed by you, Mr. Yeffett? If, if you, uh, under your system, would all of them be interviewed? Mr. Congressman, I, first I don't of want all. I a long answer. I want to know if you would interview them. If I would interview them? No, if, if, are you advocating that we have a system where all those 19 would have been interviewed? Sure. Would they, they, so every passenger is going to be interviewed? Every passenger. Okay. One so. passenger will be interviewed for two minutes. One passenger will be interviewed and be searched for more than, than 20 minutes. Okay. Yes, we will do it. Because I don't think that we allow, can allow ourselves so, so, to take the risk. I'm not, I'm not going to disagree because I don't have the expertise. I just know if that happens. Uh, uh, I'm not flying uh, because I don't want to wait an hour and a half to two hours. Um, I think you bring to this world, uh, you know, mostly international travel. And, 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 and so I can see it. But I don't see how a system works where when people are going from Boston to New York or New York to Washington, they're going to fly. I guess we take the train. Um, I mean, is that one of the outcomes of, of what you think you're proposing? that basically short flights disappear? Sir, today the American people are not flying, not because they don't like the, air, the airlines. You're not answering the question, though. I, 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 you have so much I, to share, but uh, I just want you to answer the question. I'm trying to visualize the world, and maybe you're right. I mean, I'm frustrated, not because I disagree ultimately with your conclusion. I happen to believe that you and I agree on one thing. Tell the American people the truth, whatever the hell the truth is whatever it is. And if airline traffic travel isn't safe, then let's just say it's not safe. If it's not going to be safe for a while, let's just say it's not going to be safe for a while. My view was I don't want a, a terrorist or anyone in the cockpit, so I figure if you lock the darn cockpit pit up so no one can go in, that's a good thing. And if we can make sure there aren't bombs on planes and, and weapons on planes, that's a good thing. Um, if a terrorist is in the body of the airplane and he gets in a fight with someone else and causes harm, that's not a good thing, but it's not going to bring the plane down. So in my own mind, I was thinking, well, at least if we can get explosives and cockpits. Respond to that. Mr. Congressman, if I understood you well, you are looking for your conveniency. And my answer to this is very simple. No, let me interrupt you. Just a second. You said that no, no, an hour and a half, no, no, you are not ready to no, wait. Let, let me just in, interrupt you, and then you'll get your chance. The reason why I take an airplane is convenience. If an airplane is no longer convenient, I'm not taking it. And that's all right. I mean, I will drive or I'll take a car. And so 
when you say my, my thing is convenience, I just want to be realistic about why I take a plane in the first place. And if what you do suggests I won't take a plane, then, then I accept that. I'll, I'll let you answer, but do you understand it's not just convenience, it, it's understanding why I take a plane in the first place. First of all, you can drive a few hours, but if you have to go from Washington, D.C. to L.A., how many times you can drive, sir? No, no, that, that I agree. This is number one. Number two, you are talking about your convenience, which I like to be flying with, with maximum convenience. Right. But the question is very simple today. Convenience by knowing that I'm risking my life or inconvenient by knowing that I'm gaining my life, I think, Mr. Congressman, the answer is very clear. We cannot have the stick from both sides. We love to fly with no one to bother us. I don't like to be asked any questions. I don't like to be searched. I hate. But if I know that we have to pass through this system for our safety, I want to land Okay, alive and not and not no, dead, sir. No, no, I understand that, and you and I agree. None of us wants to be killed, and we don't want our passengers to be killed, and we don't want our constituents to be killed. I understand that. I'm just trying to understand the implications of what I think is an impractical proposal in one way. It's practical for the long flight uh, because I frankly will only fly by plane. But it seems to me, and I'm asking for you. You are an honest man. I'm asking for uh, asking for an honest answer. Are the short flights basically going to be impractical because the short flights will take as long to check as the long flights, but you're only going a short distance? And do you see under your proposal that the short flights kind of disappear? The answer is very simple. There is no compromise in security. But if in a short flight from LaGuardia to a Riga airport in Washington, D.C., we want to make it faster. We just have to increase the qualified security people to do the interview. Instead of four or five people, let's take 10, 15 people, and then you will have it faster. It's only a question of money. If we are ready to spend the money, we will do it. The problem of this country that we never accepted to spend money on security. This is why the airlines sign a contract and hire the security company that offer the lowest bid. Uh, uh, bid. And to make the profit, we know whom they hired and what they paid them and how they trained them. This is why the FAA failed in their system and we have to change it. It's time to do it. Will the gentleman yield for a minute? Yeah, sure, I want to I go to that one point. If I understand correctly, prior to September 11th and including the day of September 11th, the people at the screening stations in the terminals did exactly what the FAA guidelines laid out as their duties. Am I correct in that, Mr. Morales? Yes, yes. Uh, at least in so far as we know. Right. There is I'm, nothing they did that would violate any FAA rule. Is that your understanding also, yes, sir. Mr. Hopley? Now, Mr. Yufad, I understand what you're saying. You're saying that what they did was inadequate, clearly. But the fact of the matter is that they're not the ones who screwed up here, because they did what, exactly what they were assigned to do by federal regulation, which is what Mr. Micah's point is, was earlier in terms of updating the uh, regulations accordingly. I, I know what okay. you're going to say. Okay. And I, I just want to be clear. Okay as the folks at those stations did what they were assigned to do. And if we change the assignment, then their success rate hopefully will change also. It's a shame could I, could what kind of, of security system and level we had in this country. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Shays. Yeah, I, I, I do, my time is out, but let me, so with your permission, just to ask this follow-up. How many of the 19 uh, terrorists would your interview have caught? I cannot answer the question because I didn't interview no, no one of them or my guys, but for sure I can tell you, sir, that the FBI, they had part of the names of this 19 terrorists. And if we know about this, 
my question, why these names did not go to the airlines and telling them if these names will come to take flight with us, stop them immediately and call us. And then we could avoid even the interviews. <laughs> Gentleman from Ohio. I want to thank uh, the panel here. And I'd like to follow up on some questions that my uh, good friend, Mr. Shays, was asking of, uh, of Mr. Yeffet. Take me through an interview of a, um, of a prospective passenger on Al. Al. You know, I, I okay. We I present myself to you. I have my luggage. What what do you do? Just let's go through it. I will try to do it in few sentences because I can give you a speech about this. But about well, the interview. Well, show me how it would work. Okay. First of all, qualified people should interview you. I approach to you, and I am telling you that I am the security man of your flight. And I have to ask you, sir, a few security questions okay. for your safety. Ask me the questions. Okay. Can I, can I see, first of all, your passport, sir? Okay. Here's my passport. I check your passport. Let's assume now that you are an American people, uh, passenger, so I don't have problem with your, with your passport. But if you are from Iraq or today Afghanistan or Syria, then you already uh, turn on the red light to me as a passenger. Okay, let's say, let's let's say assume, we're from one of those countries. Let's assume that you are not suspicious yet and that uh, all documents are okay. So my question will be the basic questions that I have to ask the passengers that are not suspicious and are not foreigners and they don't have problem with them. And the question are, to whom this luggage belongs? Okay, it's mine. Okay. I don't want answers that will be yes or no like the FAA. I want words to use. Who packed your luggage, sir? I did. When did you pack it? A week ago. Where did you pack it? My home. How long the luggage was left at your home or any other place? It's been with me all the time. Where with you? Did you take the luggage with you to, to work? Well, it was in my car, in the in, trunk of my car. In your car? Who drove your car except you, sir? Just me. Just you. What, do you, what is the contents of your luggage, sir? Uh, just clothes and some toiletries. Can you describe, sir? Some books, copies of the congressional record. Yeah. <laughs> He's very dangerous. You watch him. Now, the point is that I have to look at your eyes close. And once you answer me, when you lie to me, physiological changes will be seen in your face. Believe me. And wherever you lie to me, we can see that something wrong with your answer. And then we will stick on this point until we will uh, make sure that I have no problem with the lie that you gave to me. So the screeners, so the screeners then are, are not simply asking questions, they're studying the people while the people are giving the answers. Sure. And then have you ever done any um, research to determine uh, anyone who was denied boarding, were they denied boarding with justification based on evidence that was found subsequent or do you just deny people boarding and they go away? Now, uh, what happened, uh, some cases where the, the people at the last minute uh, had a cold legs, what we call, and they decided that they are not taking the flight. They were afraid to fly. One happens to us that was last minute sick, and they brought ambulance to take him. But just some, because I decided not to uh, take the flight and disappeared, it didn't happen. So your, your, uh, your position is then that if you subject passengers to greater scrutiny, there'll be less of a chance that someone would slip through who might want to do harm. That's correct. And, and with your view, it's not simply a matter of electronics. No. It's, it's people to people. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Because I like to hear you and not the luggage. So I have a question. Did, did you let me add your plane? <laughs> 
as a congressman with pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kucinich. I have actually uh, flown El Al and been subjected to the interview. And the reason I was subjected to the interview of the lengthy type was that my connecting leg plane was late. And when my wife and I rushed up, a uh, young woman, maybe 23 or 24, came and interviewed, and it was extensive. And it was exactly the questions Mr. Yafop just went through. Um, obviously, we passed the interview because we went on, but uh, it was it was very interesting, and, and it was guess. it was very very professional. Uh, according, well, to Mr. Chairman, I would guess that that given that level of scrutiny, uh, if someone was engaged in something that was irregular, uh, they'd probably be tripped up. You would imagine. I mean, I guess that, and that's what it's about. And, and obviously, your safety record has been uh, has been very strong. I do. I do want to go. I want to follow up on, on Mr. Kucinich's items. We're going to have another round here. Uh, in for El Al, you have government oversight of a private company, and the employees of the private company, if they are determined to be and performing unsatisfactorily, they can be summarily dismissed. It, prior to being employed, they receive extensive training. It's not 40 hours or 60 hours. How much is it? At least a week in the classroom and then on the job training. Now, in the classroom, we have to train them about the ter terrorist organizations. Do you want me to repeat or just to, to no, answer you? I, I, I can multitask. I heard your answer. No, no, no. Okay. No, because... Keep going. Okay. We have to train them about the terrorist organizations. We have to, to train them about countries that are su they support the terrorists. We have to train them about the uh, acts of the terrorists against the airlines around the world, why they succeeded to blow up aircraft, why they succeeded to hijack what was wrong with the security system and what should be done that this won't happen to us and then to train them how to read passport, how to approach to the passenger, how to ask the right questions, how to phrase the question in a way that it will be so clear that I want the passenger to answer me immediately and not to let him think and to tell me I didn't understand you two, three, four times. Meantime, he can think what answer to give to, give to me. I, I prefer to see a uh, uh, interviewer that is asking the questions and he can bring the passenger to answer me spontaneously. So I can now, I can determine if he is bona fide or not. Now, the, the interviewers or the personnel that I interacted with were <coughs> Both, both on the leg to Israel on the way back, uh, they were young, I mean, 25, 30 at the most. Is there some career profile for folks who do this kind of interviewing? I mean, how, how do you select the people? How long do you keep them? What characteristics do you look for, for the inter on the interviewer side? Yeah. Normally, we hire um, people to be uh, security when they are after the service in the Israeli army. And they have experience and they know how vulnerable is the country and the airlines when it comes to the uh, security. Now, we train them, as I mentioned, and we test for El Al. I used to do thousands of tests every year. When I was diplomat in this country, I used to take the people from the FBI, from Washington, from New York, Friday night at 10 o'clock at night, running an exercise when one of my group used to be the terrorists that attacked the passengers, and the other group was the defender of the uh, airlines. And we did so many exercises. 
not in order not to wait that something real happens. Any test that we used to do to our people, for them, real or test should be the same, Mr. Chairman. Who, who paid for the training process that includes these tests? Part is the government of Israel and part the airline. So there's a passenger charge in part and a, a contribution from the federal government in no. part? No. We, we did not charge the passengers uh, for security, but they charge the passengers for airport fee. That this included, I think, the, the security uh, expenses. Okay. Now, you indicate there was, you have the interviewer. And the, re the reason I'm exploring this is I want to make sure that those people who can't join us to testify today about what they're contemplating get this stuff into the record so that they can at least think about it. You have the interviewer at the terminal. You have a second layer that checks everything at the <coughs> gate, too, because I remember running down a long terminal, and when I got there, panting, the guy took me through a number, another series of questions. That person's part of the security process. You also indicate you have teams that are trained on the plane for situations. That's part of the security process. And these are all, these are all interwoven, if you will, as part of an overall package. In our training, the security people are trained to do everything from A to Z. If it's to interview passenger, if to be in the baggage room, if to search the aircraft, if to search after unattended uh, uh, luggage, or to open even ashtray to look if somebody uh, kept, uh, played, uh, replaced anything or plant everything, uh, anything there, except the armed people that we have. And this is when I, I was testifying at the beginning today, I emphasized that we have to change the system, even on the ground, especially out of this country. When the enemy will find out that he cannot hurt us on air, he will try to kill us on ground. And in security, in our aviation uh, security, we have to make sure that we covered every single point from A to Z, including the catering, the duty-free, the cargo, and so on and so on. Now, we cannot allow ourselves that we will keep one weak or hole in the system because we are dealing with sophisticated enemy that they will do enough studying to find out through which weak points they can have the access to hurt us. You've testified uh, in favor of matching baggage to passengers. So there's some element to the passenger standing there with the bag that is part and parcel of the security process. Do you think the DOT should mandate that or put it in its rules for domestic flights here in the United States? You do? Yes, sir. Mr. Merlist? No, absolutely not. We think it should be part of the overall screening process, but not 100%. So you'd, you'd use some means of uh, sorting that puts only a portion of the people through a baggage check process? Through, no, all passengers' checked baggage would be screened, but only some of the checked bags would be subject to the 100% bag match process. Is that what is done on international flights? In the international flights right now, it is 100% bag match, but we're dealing about two totally different universes. One has 1,000 flights a day, and the other has 20,000 flights a day. Uh, secondly, we've seen from the nature of the terrorist threat September 11th that 100% baggage match is not good enough. So our view is that if you have baggage match as part of an overall screening process, a 100% screening process, you'll, uh, you, you will be more likely to pick up the terrorist, suicidal terrorist, which you would not pick up on 100% baggage match. As it relates to September 11th, you're saying that the baggage match is irrelevant 
Absolutely. Okay. Mr. Hopley, how about you? How about your organization relative to the baggage match? Uh, basically go with what Mr. Merlis uh, indicated. Again, until we can get technology to the point where we can use it to try and shrink down some of these times, 100% um, baggage match in all circumstances would grind the system pretty well down to a halt. So what level of tolerance should, we're coming back to this tolerance question, what level of tolerance should Congress be willing to accept? Mr. Yafat says zero. If I'm on a plane, I got to tell you, I'm for zero. If my family's on a plane, I'm for zero. Sure. Um, I, again, just sort of taking it to a level of distraction, if you want absolute 100% certain uh, safety in the system, you just never take off. I mean, so that's one end of the continuum. And again, the other end of the continuum is absolute convenience. Up until September 11th, we had, as a government, as an industry, as a people, demanded and selected sort of one point on that continuum. It was closer to absolute convenience than it should have been. We've now shifted that to a point that is more towards absolute security, recognizing that as a practical matter, you're never going to get all the way to absolute security. Where is that right spot? Where's the sweet spot, if you will? It's a good question, and it's a question that I think it's going to be trial and error to see what the American people will tolerate in terms of increased security measures while still allowing for freedom of movement through the country. I won't ask you to define what trial and error means. Mr. Merlis? Uh, all I would say is, sir, that, that there is a role for 100 percent, for, for baggage match in this process. If you focus on the people and you identify and sort out those people who need additional scrutiny from those who, because they've got clean NCIC, INS, and customs records, they have federal security clearances, they meet a host of criteria, let the government pick up the criteria. You may have 200 million people out of our citizenry who fit that. Maybe those 200 million people you don't need a hundred need bag match for, and the other 65 million people, uh, well, I'm talking only citizens, but the other 65 million people who can't meet that test, you do need bag match for. And one of the reasons, sir, is as the statute is written, if you had 100% bag match, if there was a misconnect, and we know from our test in 1997 that one out of every 70 odd people does not make his connection, that means first of all you got to pull that one bag off of every single plane, because every plane on average has more than 70 passengers. And then how do you ever get it to somebody? You can't put it on a plane unless the passenger's on it. So we're talking about tremendous passenger inconvenience uh, uh, without necessarily the concomitant increase in security as proven September 11th. If the guy is suspicious, uh, bag match for the guy. If he's not suspicious, then screen his bag. Mr. Yafat, I know that you have a 4 o'clock commitment, <laughs> and I don't want you to miss your flight. Uh, a moment, please. One final uh, series of questions, if I might. In terms of the folks we hire, either for the interviews or for the screening or what have you, what level of tolerance should we accept for their performance? Mr. Yafat? Zero tolerance. There is difference between performance of a security man or woman that passed all the training and they have to run the security and we rely on them and if they cannot pass a test and they fail, for us, a terrorist succeeded. And therefore, we cannot replace life of anyone, and the one who failed has to go home. During the training, if the uh, uh, students, if I may call them, failed in test, they are still under the responsibility of the trainers and the security managers. Maybe something was wrong with the trainers, and therefore we will retrain them to make sure that we did the maximum. 
And if after we did the maximum, the one here or one there will fail, he has to leave and to go home. Mr. Merlis, do you share that opinion? Well, I think when you do a layered approach, you don't have to have 100%. Your, your layers have to add up to 100%. So if you have several steps in this process, if one person doesn't ask all the right questions, but the next one finds whatever the, the, the bad stuff is, then you've accomplished your goal of preventing piercing of the security system. And I think that 100% is, is not, for every single person, every single time, is not accomplishable. It's not going to happen. So what we have to do is recognize we need a system with appropriate redundancies so that when, if at 98% or 99%, uh, you know, we get that one in 100 failure, then there's a backup there who, just look at the math of it, the likelihood is the second one isn't going to have a failure on that same person. And if you had a third layer, you aren't going to have the likelihood of a, of a failure on that same person. I just don't think it's doable to have 100% for every single person every single time they ask a question. I understand the, the redundancy question concept. My question is, test. if you have someone who is not performing their particular layer of inspection, do you keep them or do you replace them? I think you replace them, but if a person once doesn't phrase a question the way Mr. Yeffet likes it, I don't think you, f you fire him. You, you retrain him and make sure he does it the right way. I mean, a person may not say the 10 words he's supposed to say. He may cut his sentence off, and now he's violated the rule. He's supposed to say it the certain way. Right. And I, I, I think the, requ the requirement cannot be so rigid that discretion isn't used, as long as the totality of the system is 100%, which I think is the goal. Mr. Yafat, in, in your experience, how, do, how have you dealt with that? If you have somebody out on the line who does not perform satisfactorily under your management, how did you handle that? I fired the director of security in Paris when he had family with children in school. And when I found out that he didn't perform properly in the level that we expect him to do it, I had to fly over there to make sure that my deputy was right with his evaluation. And once I, won, I was convinced, I fired him. Now, what uh, my colleague says here, that if the man was not trained well and made a mistake, so we have to retrain him. If he were not, was not uh, trained well, I would fire the trainer and the director of security that he assigned him to do the job. But if he was trained well and passed all the tests, and I'm talking about tests, not this question or other question. Yes. If he failed in tests, he cannot remain in the security company. If Mr. I could respond, I would agree. The fact is I was referring to the practice that is now going on that if someone misses an object, even though someone else in the redundant line picks up the object, the person's fired. And so Mr. Yefet said questions should not be asked in the negative way, which means a yes, no only. If a person asks 10 questions, under the theory that we have in place today, if a person asks 10 questions and inadvertently asks one which has a yes, no answer, he has failed and therefore should be fired. No, no. I'm against that. No, 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 I no. think that it's the overall performance and then you fire him. But I, you br I actually, the, the question of redundancy, Todd, Todd, we're going to get to you. The question <laughs> of redundancy I think is very interesting because we had an incident, I don't remember if it was Atlanta or Chicago, Chicago. where somebody got through the first level and they got caught at the random screen at the gate. The system worked, the redundancy worked. My question is that if that, if that first screen keeps missing, I mean, there's, there's a problem with either the training or the person, and they have to be fixed. And I don't know how, in an issue of this importance, you can even look past that for a moment. I mean, I, I have to tell you, Mr. Yafat's perspective on level of tolerance is a lot closer to mine than the two of yours, so. Well, just, if I may, sir, I'm not disagreeing. I agreed with him. I, I was talking about the context we have today, wherein if somebody asked a question wrong, he'd be fired. I think that's excessive. One question asked wrong, not that the person breached security, but he asked the question wrong. If his overall performance is deficient, he should be fired. Okay. 
And if his performance means he let things through that shouldn't be let through, that should be grounds for doing it. But 100%, as it's been explained to me, means you do nothing. You do not deviate one iota ever. <clears throat> and I think that is a standard which is not going to be achievable. I mean, it may be achievable for some people most of the time, but under that standard, you, you, you say a question wrong once in an eight-hour day, you're fired. That's wrong. Mr. Hopley, from the operator's standpoint of the airports and the like. Mr. Chairman, I think I forgot the question. <laughs> No, the question, the, the question had to do. The question had to do with, to what degree right. to, do you accept uh, less than satisfactory performance no, right. from your security personnel? And the answer to that is you don't. And the legislation provides the undersecretary and the Transportation Security Administration the ability to fire personnel that is not performing. Okay. I want to thank this panel. I just, I appreciate Mr. Yafai. Mr. Merlis, Mr. Hopley, your, your testimony today is compelling and highly informative. I'm sure the next panel is going to be just as good. I have, I have to tell you that as a member of Congress, I have a zero level of tolerance. There is no way to recover from a fatal mistake here. And I mean, I'm hoping that the rules and regulations incorporate that. I can't quantify you for you today what that means terms of operations, and I'm willing to take that risk, but I'd rather spend a couple hours in an airport than what may well be the alternative. Just make sure you buy things when you're in the airport, <laughs> sir. <laughs> I do regularly, trust me, I feel like I live in an airport. So thank you all for coming, Mr. Yafat. Thank you very much. Bon voyage. Thank you very Godspeed. much. We're going to take a recess of five minutes here. Today is, uh, we have, uh, fourth is outside at the moment. We have John O'Brien is the Director of Engineering and Air Safety for the Airline Pilots Association International. We have Patricia Friend, who's the President of the Association of Flight Attendants. We have Mark Roth, who's the General Counsel for the American Federation of Government Employees. And joining us shortly will be Paul Hudson, who's the Executive Director for the Aviation Consumer Action Project. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I apologize for the length of time it's taken to get to this panel. Uh, that was a, what I thought a compelling previous panel. I appreciate your patience. We have read your testimony. Uh, to the extent you can summarize, it would be appreciated. Mr. <coughs> O'Brien, for five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. I'm John O'Brien, Director. You need to turn on your microphone. Just turn it on. It's not on. Try it. Good afternoon. It's not on. Lights on, isn't it? I'll pull it closer to you. Let's see what happens. Yeah, that's on. Good afternoon. There you go. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. I am John O'Brien, Director of the Engineering and Air Safety Department for the Airline Pilots Association. ALPA represents 67,000 airline pilots who fly for 47 U.S. and Canadian airlines. We sincerely appreciate this opportunity to appear before the subcommittee to present our views on the important subject of aviation security regulations. ALPA has been in the forefront of efforts to create a more secure airline system. We're pleased, therefore, that the President last week signed into law the Aviation and Transportation Security Act. Mr. O'Brien, would you halt for a moment? Yes. I made a rookie mistake here. I need to have you all rise and swear you in. Oh. <laughs> Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Yes, I do. I do. Let the record show that the witnesses all answered in the affirmative, and now we're going to go back to Mr. Bryan. So everything you said before. Is That's right. <laughs> Start okay. This hearing is quite timely because it concerns the actual implementation of that law's numerous provisions and other initiatives. Congress. 
Congress's oversight role will be a critical, important part of any effort to prevent a repeat of some of the regulatory adventures that have occurred in the past. An example of such an adventure was the 10-year odyssey that FAA embarked upon to revise some provisions of security FARs 107 and 108, 108, which were finally published this summer. We are hopeful that the new DOT Undersecretary's Office will produce regulatory proposals and final rules in a more expeditious fashion. I would like to emphasize that ALPA strongly promotes one level of security in the implementation of federal security-related regulations. A terrorist-guided missile in the form of a fully loaded airliner can take off from any commercial airport in the country and wreak havoc on unsuspecting innocents virtually anywhere below. The type of operation is also not a discriminator. There is no difference between a fully loaded cargo airplane and a fully loaded passenger airplane in terms of their use as guided missiles. Each of our recommendations is made in this context. ALPA has, promoting, has been promoting positive electronic verification of identity and electronic airport access control systems since 1987. This is primary as a result of the PSA accident that was mentioned earlier this afternoon. This accident was caused by an armed, disgruntled former airline employee and in effect was a mass murder of 43 passengers and crew members and bears striking similarities to the hijackings of September 11th. This accident was attributable in large measure to the identity verification inadequacies that have yet to be addressed 14 years later. On the heels of that tragedy, FAA revised airport security regulations to require that many airports install computerized access control systems. In the mid-90s, Congress provided $2 million for testing and implementing a transient employee security system that came to be known as the Universal Access System, or UAS. For all practical purposes, those funds were wasted. Even though FAA completed successful UAS tests and standards were finalized for the system in 98, there has been no implementation of the system. This failure came as a result of the FAA policy to leave UAS implementation to the sole discretion of the airlines. Identifying, excuse me, in the meantime, technology has moved on and the standards devised for UAS are no longer current. FAA has now finished a report on smart card systems for identifying armed law enforcement officers who are using or supporting our transportation system. The private sector is developing proposals based on that and other advanced technologies such as biometric readers. The new Aviation Security Act provides for pilot programs at no fewer than 20 airports to test and evaluate new and emerging technology for access control and other security requirements. While we wholeheartedly endorse testing new technologies, there also must be requirements to install them or testing is for naught. Therefore, we recommend the standards be immediately developed and made regulatory for the creation of a U.S. that could use the best technologies available. The test at the 20-plus airports should be used to validate technologies designed to meet the new standard. In addition to providing positive access control for employees, the UAS must also be used to facilitate employee screening at checkpoints in order to reduce delays for passengers, verify the identity of jump seat riders, and it could be used as a media for digital pilot licensing or certificate information. ALPA is also very supportive of efforts to perform voluntary treks checks on trusted passengers so that the amount of time spent at security screen chunk points is reduced. The UAS system could be used for that purpose and perhaps others that have not been yet considered. I'd like to turn our, your attention to the new Security Act's provision to require security screening of all checked bags and the screening of cargo and mail and cargo aircraft. We agree with these provisions as far as they go because the potential for carrying a bomb-laden bag onto an aircraft is very real and needs to be addressed as soon as possible. However, the new security provi law provides the DOT Undersecretary with a one-year study period for reporting on the screening requirements applicable to aircraft with 60 or fewer passenger seats used in scheduled passenger service. We thought we had rid ourselves of dual regulatory standards with a successful one level of safety campaign, but apparently that's, that isn't so. We recommend that the airline security regulations be amended to require one level of security the security screening of all passengers and their baggage. Such action would be consistent with the precedents established by DOT and FAA under the 1995 One Level of Safety Regulatory Initiatives. 
There are a number of issues surrounding the strengthening of cockpits that are deserving of congressional attention. We are encouraged by the rapid move towards full voluntary passenger fleet compliance with special federal regulations on cockpit door hardening that the FAA recently issued. However, some important debates are now underway about how best to make longer-term aircraft flight deck security improvements. Everyone understands the basic concept of installing stronger flight deck doors to keep terrorists out of the cockpit. What may not be as readily apparent is the need for strengthening of the cockpit floor as well as the bulkhead to which the door is attached. A strong door offers little protection if it's connected to a weak frame. Another question is whether cockpit door hardening and other related security enhancements should be made for cargo aircraft. We believe that they should because cargo aircraft have been tar the target of security breaches in the past and they could be used as terrorist guided missiles just like a passenger carrying aircraft. FAA has recently enacted special regulations to encourage cockpit door strengthening, include allocation of federal funds for doors on passenger aircraft. However, they did not specify cargo aircraft, so these aircraft are not being retrofitted in spite of the fact that DOT's rapid response team for aircraft security recommended retrofits for the entire U.S. fleet. Mr. You're about finished there. I'm just about, I'm going to skip the last one okay. here and just say thank you, and I'll be pleased to answer any questions. <laughs> That is an excellent wrap-up. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. Ms. Friend. Thank you, and, and good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Uh, my name is Patricia Friend, and I'm the international president of the Association of Flight Attendants, and we very much appreciate the opportunity to testify today. The American people have made it clear that they expect the government to correct fundamental problems in our air security system before they will, will resume normal travel patterns. Our nation's flight attendants have not had the luxury of picking and choosing when we fly. We went right back to work after September the 11th. Flight attendants continue to comfort anxious passengers while we cope with not only our own concerns and fears about our personal safety, but our grief for fellow flight attendants who lost their lives. I speak to you today from the perspective of the more than 50,000 flight attendants at 26 U.S. airlines represented by the Association of Flight Attendants. The Aviation and Transportation Security Act of 2001, signed into law last week by President Bush, makes crucial improvements in the security of our aviation system, but there's still more to do. Federalizing airport security screening and creating a new transportation security agency separate from the Federal Aviation Administration was a vital improvement in securing our skies. We support Secretary Mineta's goal of a new security agency that focuses solely on security, and we support the hiring of a qualified candidate from law enforcement or the military to head that agency. Just as important, we welcome the increased presence of air marshals, strengthened cockpit doors, and the new training that we will receive. We welcome the screening of everything and everyone with access to secure areas of airports and enhanced identification of airport personnel through the use of new technologies. Yet there are gaps still in our aviation security system, and we are counting on you to provide flight attendants with the tools that we need to protect our passengers and ourselves in the event of a future attack. As we have tragically seen, once a security threat in the cabin compromises the flight deck, the aircraft and lives on the ground are in jeopardy. Securing cockpit doors and providing pilots with a defensive device are key to ensuring that terrorists will not in the future be able to use our planes as missiles. But the new law fails to require flight attendant access to non-lethal devices in the cabin. The flight attendants have become the first and last line of defense for passengers. We are responsible for ensuring that a security threat doesn't reach the cockpit. To effectively meet that responsibility, we must be given the means to defend ourselves, our passengers, and the flight deck from intruders. You can accomplish this by ensuring that flight attendants will be trained and qualified in the use of an appropriate non-lethal weapon stored in a sealed or locked compartment somewhere on the aircraft. At some level, government licenses automobile drivers, teachers, contractors, plumbers, nurses, doctors, a variety of other citizens and professionals. These licenses are issued in order to control and ascertain a level of proficiency. Flight attendants are trained in emergency, safety, and security operations on board an aircraft, but currently the Federal Aviation Administration does not license flight attendants. 
In virtually every in-flight situation, emergency or otherwise, flight attendants are the only trained professionals present to provide first aid to passengers, fight in-flight cabin fires, provide guidance during a decompression or turbulence, handle unruly passengers who might endanger the safety of other passengers or the flight, and even help passengers out of an airplane after a crash. Now, with the passage of the new law and the additional security training that will be provided to flight attendants, it's time for the public and other aviation workers to be given the assurance that flight attendants have been trained and are qualified to perform their duties. The best way to accomplish this is by the FAA licensing flight attendants. The size and amount of carry-on baggage directly affects the job of security screeners and the potential for a weapon to be brought on board the aircraft. Currently, an FAA security directive exists that limits carry-on baggage to one bag plus one personal item per passenger. The new security law includes a sense of Congress that the FAA should maintain its current restrictions on carry-on bags. The government now needs to go a step further and codify this limitation in its security regulations in order to avoid the possibility that the current FAA security directive could be changed or eliminated at any time. The new security law states that where baggage screening machines are not available, alternatives to screening checked baggage, such as a bag match program, are required. But regrettably, it does not require 100% baggage passenger match. Nothing short of 100% bag match and 100% evaluation of all passengers will close this loophole in the aviation security <coughs> system. The last issue I'll bring to your attention is currently one of the most controversial for flight attendants at many of our U.S. carriers. Recent security directives have required that each aircraft cabin be thoroughly searched before the first flight of the day. Secretary Mineta's rapid response team on aircraft security reported that current procedures allow inadequately trained personnel to conduct these searches for dangerous items hidden on board the aircraft. The DOT team also reported that insufficient time is given to assigned personnel in order to conduct a thorough search. We agree with the rapid response team, which made specific recommendations that security searches be assigned to trained experts and not to cockpit or cabin crew members. Currently, cabin security searches are being done by airline staff, including flight attendants at 14 AFA-represented carriers. Airline management further compromises security by forcing flight attendants <clears throat> to complete a review of their safety equipment and a thorough security search of the aircraft in as little as five minutes, all in order to ensure an on-time departure. While these policies are within the current FAA directive, they guarantee that inadequate searches are performed, making them, in effect, a sham. Security searches, as I'm sure you will agree, are important tasks that belong in the hands of trained security personnel who are part of the new Transportation Security Administration at the Department of Transportation. Overall, we are pleased with the new security law, and we believe that many crucial security loopholes will now be closed once all of the provisions of the new law are put into effect. It is essential, however, to move swiftly on the additional security enhancements to correct continuing flaws in our aviation security system. Hundreds of millions of U.S. passengers and crew fly each year. We deserve a truly safe and a secure environment. Thank you for allowing me to testify, and I welcome any questions. Thank you, Ms. Friend. Mr. Roth from the American Federation of Government Employees Thank for five you. minutes. Uh, on behalf of the 600,000 government workers represented by AFGE, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity to offer our views focused on potential employee concerns regarding the implementation of the Aviation and Transportation Security Act. Regardless of the issue of federalization, I believe we all can agree that screening will not improve if the job status of screeners is not improved through better pay, better benefits, and real job protections. Ultimately, there is no other way to recruit the best employees and to keep them on the job. Regarding job protections, the Act gives unfettered discretion to the Secretary to summarily dismiss any federal employee screeners, regardless of tenure or proven cause. AFGE firmly believes that such unprecedented discretion is unnecessary, and we wish to point out that already during the lengthy one-year probationary period, a federal employee may be immediately fired 
for virtually any or no reason. In the context of these particular inspection jobs, competent, focused supervisors should be able to easily weed out the bad actors within a very short time. Following the probationary period, in a non-security context, under 5 U.S.C. 4303, a federal employee can be fired or demoted with 30 days' notice. In accordance with elementary notions of due process, that employee can then appeal his or her case. However, according to the Office of Personnel Management, a very small number of dismissals and demotions are reversed through such appeals. And it is also important to point out that the employee is off the federal payroll. They are off the federal payroll while the appeal is pending. More importantly, here where airport security is now a national security issue, under 5 U.S.C. 7532, an employee may be suspended without notice and then removed after such investigation and review as considered necessary by the agency in the interests of national security. In that context, the agency need not provide the employee the rationale for a dismissal, and the agency's decision to dismiss that employee is not subject to appeal. Thus, in the context of airport screeners and airport security, we believe these existing Title V management authorities to remove these workers are already extremely broad and sufficient. The new law also gives the Secretary unprecedented discretion to determine the compensation packages and job protections of the federal employee screeners, quote, notwithstanding any other law. AFGE believes here, too, that such unlimited discretion is unnecessary and actually counterproductive to maintaining a high-quality workforce. There is simply no reason for federal employee screeners to be treated differently than other federal employees with respect to their pay, benefits, and after-the-fact job protections. The report language to the conference report encourages the Secretary to ensure that screeners have access to federal health, life insurance, retirement benefits, and whistleblower protections. We believe, though, that fixing terms and conditions of employment in statute would ensure that the lowest bid mentality that so undermined contractor airport, secure, airport screening will not be repeated after federalization of the function. Therefore, AFGE urges the Congress to revisit the issue to expressly provide federal employee airport screeners with the same compensation packages and job protections as other federal employees. It is clearly not in the interest of any American who values her or his freedom to fly to undermine the federal government's ability to recruit and retain the best airport screeners by making them second-class federal employees. AFG does not believe it is the intention of either lawmakers or administration officials to allow such a scenario to unfold. AFG looks forward to ensuring that federal employee screeners are treated equitably vis-a-vis -vis other federal employees with respect to issues like pay, health insurance, EEO rights, life insurance, retirement benefits, the right to organize and be represented by unions, and whistleblower protections. The rights of federal employees to organize and bargain collectively in particular serve as a check against the office politics and the pressures not to disclose safety violations identified by the whistleblower group Government Accountability Project and its argument in favor of whistleblower protections for airport screeners. With respect to matters concerning public safety, it often falls to rank and file federal employees to alert the Congress. At will employees, like these screeners, will not risk coming forward. Such warnings are most likely to be encouraged when the employees with the relevant information can go safely, even anonymously, to their union that will protect them from arbitrary retaliation. Thus, it promotes the interests of the millions of American air travelers if the screener workforce is free of coercion and free to organize. Finally, there is no plausible rationale for denying federal employee screeners the right to organize. AFGE is proud to represent tens of thousands of other federal employees engaged in public safety, such as Bureau of Prisons Correctional Officers, DOD Police, law enforcement officers throughout every agency, INS employees, and firefighters. Moreover, today, airport customs officials are represented by unions, as are the skilled machinists, the baggage handlers, the mechanics, the air traffic controllers, and those in the front lines, the flight attendants and pilots. There is no reason to treat a federal employee screener's right to organize any differently. AFGE will work with the administration to ensure that federal employee airport screeners have the right, if the workers so elect, 
to be represented by a union. Again, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this important and timely hearing. I look forward to answering any questions that you and your colleague may wish to ask. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Our final witness is Paul Hudson, who's the Executive Director of the Aviation <coughs> Consumer Action Project. Thank you for joining us today for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Turney. My name is Paul Hudson. I'm Executive Director of the Aviation Consumer Action Project, or ACAP, which is a nonprofit organization that since 1971 has acted as a voice and ear for the public on major aviation issues. ACAP has been a national advocate for strengthened aviation security measures since the 1980s and has been a member representing the public on the FAA's Aviation Security Advisory Committee and its Aviation Rulemaking Advisory Committee since 91. In 98, I co-chaired uh, the Security Group's Working Group for Public Education. And since 89, I've testified about a dozen times before Congress and two presidential uh, commissions on the subject. Since September 11th, I served on the FAA's Ad Hoc Aviation Security Subcommittee, which was evaluating new aviation security technologies and procedures, and was on the team evaluating airport screening. I'd like to thank you very much for holding this hearing today. With the enactment of legislation last week, this is a very timely and very important next step. What are the details? What are the regulations going to be? Before getting into that, though, I need to mention the goals that we need to keep in mind. First, obviously, is to pre prevent a repeat of the 9-11 attacks or any variation thereof, whereby U.S. civilian aircraft are used as weapons of mass destruction. Second, to protect air transportation, which is an important part of the nation's infrastructure and our way of life. As we go through the process of regulation, we also need to keep in mind a unique feature in this type of regulation. That is that the details of security regulations, unlike other uh, types of regulation, are secret. This means that the level of Congress oversight must be at a higher level. And also, you must have a, uh, a new aviation, excuse me, a new transportation security advisory committee that has highly effective public members. Because there is no peer review, there is no public comment process, there is no public scrutiny uh, that normally applies in this field. Otherwise, we fear that the egregious policies uh, of the past, some of which contributed to the success of the 9-11 attacks, could potentially even be repeated. Obviously not the same things, but different ones in the same vein. Moreover, the FAA practice of granting largely unrestricted waiver and exemptions to air carriers, airports, and others would be also likely to continue, we feel. The first test of the new system is going to be who the people the administration appoints to lead the effort. The second test will be what those people do, particularly in the key areas of security regulation and standards. The third test will be the performance of the new agency in the coming months. And the final test will be whether additional large-scale aviation and transportation terrorism is prevented. Congress needs to be kept up to date and needs to have appropriate oversight in each of these uh, areas. With regard to transportation security <coughs> personnel hiring criteria, in addition to the things that are mandated in the Act, we feel there should be national security background checks. And with the pay and benefits having been effectively tripled for screeners, hiring can and should be on a competitive basis, with only the best being hired for training, those who meet the high standards surviving training, and only those who pass a probationary period being retained. Concerning employee training, there should be a minimum of 30 days training for all security personnel, or 175 hours. <coughs> this is the same or less than what we have in, in many other areas of uh, security. Proficiency tests and occasional spot testing are inadequate. Uh, the current system fosters boredom, constant small talk, and general lack of seriousness. 
I've indicated in my testimony we need a universal in-depth screening system, and I would refer to my written testimony for the details of that. We also feel the cockpits need to be triple sealed and secured. In my uh, testimony before the House and the Senate, our first point was you must secure the cockpits. That's only been partially done to this point. There needs to be a reduction in carry-on luggage to levels that the screening system will be able to detect reliably at least 95 percent of prohibited items. We need frequent testing of screening with test objects as exercises as well as uh, winner-take-all type gotcha tests we have now. And since most screeners will never face a terrorist, unlike law enforcement officers, we need to utilize uh, military-type exercises and gaming techniques. Otherwise, people will not maintain the level of alertness, no matter how, in principle, they may be motivated. With regard to where we start, I think a model aviation security program and training facility needs to be established at Reagan National Airport. It has all the ingredients needed for that. And if we're going to have a national uniform standard, we need to have a center, especially to start out with. Regarding employee and passenger identification, the industry is heavily pushing smart cards. Um, these things would have fingerprint <coughs> aspects to them. Face recognition uh, is another technology that's being, that's being pushed. We feel they have a role to play, particularly for access of employees to sensitive areas, but they should not be issued uh, to enable passengers to bypass or avoid standard security checks. Smart terrorists will be able to obtain them. And even trusted employees, there is always a danger of them going to the dark side. If you look at the profiles which have outlined my testimony of smart terrorists, most of them would be able to obtain these smart cards. Now, there's often confusion about reducing the risk of aviation bombings. The things that need to be done in that area are not the same for the most part as anti-hijacking measures. Hardening of, uh, excuse me, installing hardened cargo and baggage containers would be a very important first step. Passenger bag matching still is valid. Um, none of the, the historical <coughs> aviation bombings have involved suicide bombings, and many involve dupes. Explosive detection equipment for screening of checked baggage. This needs to be expedited with regulations, if necessary, to ensure that we have the equipment in the legislative time frames. There's presently only one manufacturer that makes the stuff, and um, we're going to have to do something to change that if we want to have the uh, congressional mandates met. Mr. Hudson, the red light went off because I turned it off, but if okay. you can wrap I'm, it up, uh, I'm great. not going to go through the rest of it, but I would just uh, conclude by saying that the challenges and terrorist threats we now face, especially in aviation security, are immense, but the resources of this nation are also enormous. The federal government needs to place its full power and energies to secure the skies over America and look forward to ans answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. I want to uh, preface my questions by conveying to Ms. Friend and Mr. O'Brien the sentiment of the Congress regarding your colleagues who aren't with us today. Uh, and to Mr. Hudson, for your loss, we're going to try and do everything we can to prevent that from repeating itself. And I thank you all for coming here today to talk about it. I want to go to a question we dealt with in the last panel having to do with the level of tolerance to accept uh, whether in terms of what gets through or performance in the screening process. Mr. O'Brien, were all of you here for the previous panel's testimony? So you heard the body of the conversation. Do you have any thoughts on, I mean, as we set this system up, 
with these rules and regulations, the issue of zero tolerance, where should we be on that spectrum as it relates to either the interview screening process or the performance level of the uh, folks in that process? Obviously, in the interviewing and screening process, applicants should be held to the highest standards, of course. Move that closer to you, please. For the interviewing and screening process, applicants should be held to the highest standard, of course. This is similar to people or personnel who are involved in safety-critical endeavors as well. However, as far as disciplinary or firing situations are I would suggest that there may be some value in looking at the safety programs that are currently in effect. We have programs now that apply to certain safety disciplines where if there is a deliberate violation of a regulation or deliberate act to compromise the safety or a criminal act, then there is no recourse for the individual. However, if the act or situation is not deliberate, inadvertent, and an individual reports on him or herself, then there is an investigation undertaken jointly by the oversight responsibility, in this case maybe the FAA, the employer, and if a union is involved, the union representation. Corrective action is identified, and in this particular case, FAA has veto power over whether that corrective action is appropriate or not. So I think something like that might be considered for security procedures and application of those procedures and following those procedures by individuals because there are certain degrees of compliance. No matter how good the procedures are, there may be faults with the procedure development itself. And if employees recognize those faults through self-use and report on those faults and they're analyzed properly, then I don't think disciplinary action in that particular case is warranted. Ms. Friend? We believe that the aviation security has to be a series of layers, and the first line of defense must be on the ground. I mean, that's our training today, is to keep the aggression off from the aircraft. So to that extent, we strongly support um, the, the most comprehensive and, and uh, inviolate as possible first line of defense on the ground. But having said that, we also advocate on behalf of our members, the concept of train to proficiency. Um, we believe strongly that uh, a person who, um, who is interviews and is qualified for a job deserves the best possible training, and that a failure uh, is most often attributable to a failure in the training process, not in, not in the individual. However, uh, we also support Mr. O'Brien's um, position that someone who deliberately, deliberately compromises uh, aviation security uh, clearly falls outside the realm of, uh, of a training issue. Um, but we, um, part, part of my oral testimony that I left out in order to meet the uh, five-minute limit um, really did focus on the uh, projected training for the security screeners. Uh, there's been um, some talk of a minimum number of hours. We think it's premature to set a minimum number of hours. We believe that um, an, an expert in aviation security should develop a comprehensive training program and then tell us how many hours that will take to offer to the new uh, federalized security screening force. Mr. Chairman, first of all, I want to say very clearly for the record that AFGE is not in the business of defending poor performers, people who could not do competent airport screening. The purpose of my testimony was to let you know that there are current, current tools in existing law which are extremely broad that are not used properly by supervisors, uh, such as probationary periods and such as 7532 of Title V. I don't know how many of you were familiar with that provision on national security. It's very broad. If someone is on the lines and they're deemed a national security problem, they are gone immediately. They don't even find out why. The other thing is there's a difference between zero tolerance and no right of an appeal after the fact. It is counterproductive if you give these people no rights uh, where a workplace may be very arbitrary. There may be arbitrary conduct at the workplace. Some of, sometimes there are politics with a small p 
at a, at a small workplace. Um, and a supervisor can be allowed to run rampant and can be allowed to coerce, terrorize, or actually, you know, put in fear a workplace so that they will not come forward with safety violations, they have no union, they have nowhere to go, they will leave. Um, you've, you know, there are environments where you have hostile supervisors and you've got to go along to get along. You must have some balance in this system, and we think the after-the-fact appeal, because mistakes are made, um, although most cases employees lose, let's face it, 80%, that means that in 20% of the cases, there was a mistake made, bad supervision, um, improper motive on the supervisor, but to be able to just say that an employee is not uh, meeting a standard where there's no right of an appeal to show that you did meet the standard, I think goes way too far. So we're not in business to protect a poor performer, someone who has proven to be a poor for performer, but also not to have a counterproductive uh, set of rules that has people leave the agencies as soon as they're trained and go off to customs, INS, where they are strongly unionized, and these types of small p politics and games are not played. Mr. Hudson? Um, with respect to uh, this uh, discipline pro approach, uh, we would say for any serious infraction, you should remove the person first and then have the due process follow. It's a similar process that's used with air traffic controllers. Um, we also support, uh, however, having whistleblower protection for these people. Uh, we think that's very important as a, as a, uh, a preventive against uh, corruption or other abuses. Um, with regard to minor things, uh, poor performance, uh, there should be penalties for poor performance. And the, the approach that has been taken in the existing system, which is, I see is in some of the legislation, I'm not sure whether it got into the final bill, is that you can fail a proficiency test, and then you get some remedial uh, training and you, you go back. Um, no one who fails proficiency tests should go back until they pass the proficiency tests. Thank you. My, we, uh, we up here have the red lights, too. I want to make sure I just synthesize. None of you have objection to removal of someone from the front line, so to speak. It's the summary, summary uh, dismissal issue, absent retraining or an appeal process, the due process, I think, was the phrase that you used, Mr. Roth. Uh, you think that protection should remain in the rules and regulations. Is that accurate, Mr. O'Brien? That's correct. Ms. Friend? That's correct. Mr. Roth? That's correct. I would yes, make sir. one other point on whistleblower protection. It's very rare to have an individual whistleblower. It's much more common to have a whistleblower go through a union or another group. So just to say we're going to give you a whistleblower right, that is not going to get it done. People, the experience, the studies, even from the special counsel, people are too afraid to put themselves forward alone. All right, Mr. Hudson. I mean, did I synthesize your remarks yes. accurately? All right, my time's expired. We'll have another round. Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Roth. I think the, the problem that some people had, uh, you hit right on the head with this legislation, some people objected to having the security issue federalized because they didn't want it unionized. Uh, and that was it. And I think Mr. Miker, without putting words in his mouth, raised at least part of that reservation when he made the comment in his testimony that it takes three and a half years to discipline a uh, federal employee. Would you address that for us? I have some problems with that because they throw out that number. And there may be a case, and there may be an EEO process. But in most cases, like I, I told you, during the first year, they're gone immediately, and there are no appeal rights. Um, after that, you have 30 days, and then you, know, you have a right to respond. Under this law, you don't even have a right to notice and to respond. And it may not even be constitutional in that regard. There are some cases on that. However, um, in most cases, you have 30 days, you have a right to respond, and then you're gone, and you're, you have a case. You have a day of hearing. Now, the, it may go on on appeal to some other federal agency for months and months where you never hear about it and no one uh, works on it, but that doesn't mean the employee is not gone. They are, there's no paycheck. They've, they, 
they have to move on. So on paper, you may have a case, but that person's gone within about 30 days. Thank you. I think it was helpful to clarify that. Uh, Ms. Friend, you indicated that you thought flight attendants should have access to non-lethal means of protection on a flight. Can you give me some specifics of examples of what you mean by that? Um, I, I sat on the uh, Secretary's rapid response team for aircraft security, and we specifically recommended um, a list of uh, the evaluation of a list of non-lethal devices, uh, including stun guns, tasers, mace, pepper spray. Um, we have asked for really uh, four areas of defense in the cabin. Uh, now that we've fortified the cockpit doors, which we absolutely support, um, change the procedures to say that, that the pilots will not, um, not compromise the security of the cockpit by coming out to assist in any disturbance, no matter how difficult. Uh, we've asked for additional uh, training, including upgraded security training, personal defense training. We've asked for an, uh, an emergency means of notification to notify the cockpit that a hijacking was in progress, and we've asked for access to uh, a non-lethal defense we weapon. None of these things are, are intended in any way uh, to suggest that flight attendants could somehow overpower um, any um, violent hijacker, but they are intended to buy us time in the cabin, to buy us time, to buy our passengers time, in order to allow the pilots to get the aircraft on the ground safely, which is where the only real help in that situation is. Thank you. Uh, I'd like each of you to uh, address this issue of a trusted passenger concept, if you would. I, I've heard it mentioned several times, the apparent uh, insinuation being that there were some people that could be screened once uh, rigorously, and after that they got some special uh, passage onto the plane without going through the customary and uh, every uh, occasion flight um, review. Can you share with me your feelings on, on that concept, starting with Mr. O'Brien, and we'll work uh, my left to, to my right. Conceptually, the uh, proposal has some merit. Uh, I have not seen any specific details of how it actually would be employed what kind of um, screening would be required in order to make you a so-called trusted passenger, uh, what kind of identification system would be set up, and how the trusted passengers would actually be handled. In concept, though, it has been offered as a means of expediting the flow of traffic through the checkpoints, the various checkpoints, and for that purpose it has merit. But until we see some more details on exactly how it would be employed, how it would be employed in actuality, um, we just sort of embrace it as a potential means of expediting the flow through checkpoints, but with some reservations. We actually uh, strongly object. Um, we're very concerned that it creates um, a, a section of our aviation security that could be easily compromised. Um, it is just enti it's entirely inconceivable to me that some sort of identification could be created that could not be uh, forged, that is not subject to fraud. Um, in addition, you um, have to ask yourself, once this is issued, is this a, a lifetime pass, or uh, does the person have to um, subject themselves to repeated security in order to renew their, their license, sort of license to bypass um, security. So we, we have grave reservations and, in fact, object to the concept. Well, of course, I'm unqualified. Let me say it right up front. I'm just an air traveler. However, when you talk about and something... Gag you and, go out the next you, and, and with Mr. Yafet here before, I, I think there are other places I would rather have been. Um, uh, but when you talk about a system needing zero tolerance, that is a system that would need zero tolerance. As an air traveler, I would be concerned that, that you would have this system and they would, you know, be in, uh, not inconvenienced, but how would you have the zero tolerance in place? But again, that's as a non-professional. Uh, we're, we're strongly opposed to uh, this, this uh, concept as well as uh, the proposals that, I, that I've seen. Um, not only can smart terrorists uh, probably and undoubtedly will get these cards, and some proponents have talked about um, pre-screening as many as 50 million Americans. Um, but we have to remember that we're dealing with very smart terrorists today. They are um, professionals at identity theft. A number of the 9-11 terrorists use that method. Document forgery. 
uh, creation of fictitious identities. And when you get one of these uh, smart cards, as they're called, um, they're only as good as the, um, the initial establishment of identity. So, for instance, the leader of the 9-11 attacks, who had a, a graduate degree in um, city planning, and uh, a number of the other terrorists have either had uh, pilot's licenses or pilot training. Um, other master terrorists have had engineering backgrounds. Uh, many of them have frequent flyer cards. And they have the full uh, panoply of ID that we expect of, of, a, of a normal uh, American uh, uh, traveler. In order to uh, screen out that sort of thing, you would have to engage in some very legally questionable profiling um, involving um, not only national origin, religion, uh, a whole host of things that I think would cause uh, serious problems. The airlines that I've heard their proposals of anyway are not talking about any kind of um, uh, negative profiling with respect to this. It would be non-discriminatory and probably not restricted even to Americans. Um, the other big problem with it is that it's um, in effect reverse or positive profiling. And instead of uh, saying that this is a group that we need to give extra attention to because there, there could be a higher correlation of, of, of them being a terrorist, we're going to say, well, this group is our good guys, and we don't have to worry so much about them, or we don't have to worry about them at all. Um, profiling historically has been a failure in aviation security. Uh, if we go back to um, the original anti-hijacking profile system in the 1960s, before metal detectors, before x-ray machines, we were up to almost one hijacking a week. And we had a profiling system, essentially an eyeball profiling system at that time. Um, profiling has had its successes, but it's also had some dramatic failures. They tried to profile the Unabomber for six years. It, it failed. Um, and in the case of the CAP system, which is the current profiling system, um, that obviously failed to check or detect any of the 19 hijackers on 9-11, even though apparently six or seven of them should have been flagged. So um, profiling, whether it's negative or positive, has major problems. It is necessary to do it, but it's not something you can rely on uh, over, overly, over a, a universal system. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. I want to follow up on a couple specific questions. Mr. O'Brien, you heard Mr. Yafat's testimony about the personal interviews. Do you support that as part and parcel of our security processes? Yes, indeed. It is an important element in an overall systems approach to security. 100% or a select portion of the passenger load? Of it. Uh, I'm not sure that um, we heard a 100% requirement, even though we've vacillated around that. We talked about a, a, a mini set of questions, and depending upon how what that many set of questions went, then you went into more detailed questioning. So it was a sort of a domino type system, depending right. upon the initial reaction. So if you take it from that perspective, everybody would get some initial questioning. So it'd be 100% from that perspective, but the detailed questioning would entirely depend upon what kind of response you got from the initial questions. But the, in, the initial questions, the two-minute drill, so to speak, you'd support that? Uh, some version of that, and again, that, that would depend upon, it would depend upon the other components of the total systems approach to doing business. The third and the fourth and the fifth layers, so to speak. Exactly. And we spent a lot of time talking about the events of September 11th and these 19 individuals and what would would not have worked, there's no guarantee that we're going to be ever face that scenario again. So that speaks highly to a systems approach that takes a much broader view of potential terrorist threats, some that we've already experienced, some that we know about but have not experienced yet. So we really do need a systems approach, everything from the 100% bag matching to you name it, many things that we haven't even talked about today that are included in some of the testimony I've read. You, you support something more than the present two questions? Yes. Okay. 
Ms. Friend, how about the flight attendants? Uh, we do, and, it, and it, it may be as simple as just changing the, the, the way you ask the question so it's no longer a yes or no question, but I think the real issue here is who is asking the question. It's not unlike um, our testimony on, on the airlines using flight attendants to do aircraft security sweeps. We are now asking uh, overworked airline ticket agents to ask these questions while they're also trying to check bags and assign seats and, and, uh, and check connections. It should be a function of the newly created Transportation Security Agency uh, and those personnel to ask these questions. So their only job is security. Okay, and you guys deal with this every day. Mr. Roth and I are probably occasional travelers. Mr. Roth, your opinion on the... Well, I will tell you that the last time I traveled, which was about a month ago, um, I got asked the questions by the person at, at the baggage counter, and I had to keep pushing my driver's license to them. They were more concerned about someone not being on the shift and therefore the line piling up, and I, I was like begging, you know, don't you want to see it? Your point, take that off the guy at the gate or the I counter. I agree with taking it okay. off. I don't, I, it's, they're not paying attention to it. Okay. And it's silly to ask the question if you're not going to look at the person and take it seriously. Mr. Hudson? I, I would agree that uh, we need to take uh, questioning away from the airline personnel and give it to the new um, security personnel. I think a few questions um, uh, for everyone are appropriate. And as I've indicated in my written testimony, um, certain, uh, certain people um, should in fact get a, an interrogation. Okay, now let me, work, let me work backwards from my right to the left. Mr. Hudson, you support a match between the passengers and the baggage, 100%, if I understand yes. your testimony. The, the reason for that and why it's so important initially is we don't have the screening equipment, we don't have the bomb detectors in place. If we had 100% screening of, of baggage, with bomb detectors as well as uh, machines to detect weapons for the carry-ons, that would not be so important. Okay, Mr. Roth, I'm going to have to pass on that okay. one. So, Ms. Friend, yeah, yes, we support it. And initially, it may be the only means we have to um, to improve the security of our checked baggage because, in fact, there aren't enough of the um, explosive detectors uh, to do 100% screening. But even after we have sufficient um, equipment to do 100% screening. Those machines are not um, absolutely guaranteed 100% accurate either. And so the continued use of passenger baggage match adds, again, another layer uh, of security. Um, there was a study done um, by um, MIT participated in it um, in the past few years on uh, baggage match in the domestic market, and it is not impossible. I mean, that has been the position of the industry all along, that it would, br it would bring the entire system grinding to a halt. This study proved that, in fact, that is not true, right. um, that it could be implemented domestically and be integrated into the system without um, a great deal of trouble. They simply don't want to do it. Mr. O'Brien, how the pilots feel? We support 100% screening and 100% bag match, and I disagree entirely with the opinions I heard earlier today that it would grind the system to a halt. Uh, we have seen technology that uh, obviously is in the prototype stage now that would make passenger bag matching um, a very simple process and could be used far beyond just the matching process. So it's a matter of time to get all this implemented, but we should have or continue to have a goal of 100% screening and matching. All right. Just want to summarize. You all support the initial questioning, something more than yes or no, and you support those who responded, passenger baggage match. My time's expired, Mr. Tierney. Thank you. I just want to ask, I think uh, Ms. Friend or Mr. Roth and maybe Mr. O'Brien has some people that his organization represents that might be affected. Is there any reason that any of you see that people that were laid off as a result of the events of September 11th a significant number of people that are associated with the airline industry could not be reemployed as part of the security operation with the proper uh, physicals and um, training? None that I'm aware of. I think that several of the people who have been laid off could make very valuable contributions to what we're trying to do in a security sense. Uh, AFG would agree with that. Ms. Friend, you also agree? Yes. Uh, it's something that uh, we've been advocating, or a number of us have been advocating. I assume that. Um, 
that you would have some reason if, uh, if you didn't agree with us, and that's why I asked that question. Um, and then the, the last question I have is just basically a throwaway question out of curiosity, uh, Mr. O'Brien. Is there a valid reason why people f uh, flying from New York or Boston to Washington on the shuttle cannot get out of their seat in the last half hour of the flight? It's only the, it's only the national. Uh, I understand this. this I just said it's going international. It's only international airport, and that's Whatever. because Reagan National is guaranteed the gold standard of aviation security, unlike the rest of the airports in this country, which apparently are only guaranteed second-rate aviation security. And I can tell you, in case you want to know, what happens if you do get up. I can because imagine we, what happens if you do get up. I guess it, it, I was wondering first if, yeah. if why is it that you can't get up? Uh, uh, I can only assume that that, they're, that it, they somehow think that adds to the uh, to the security. But well, uh, as, as representative of the flight attendants, do you think it adds to the security? No, I, 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 think, Brian, I do you think, think it adds to the security? window dressing. It, it, it obviously is a first step in a profile that has been developed, a scenario mm -hmm. of events that leads to a particular situation, and uh, those who are are very anxious from a security perspective to event that profile from ever or that sequence of events from ever occurring. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, the, the sequence of events, we have profile for September 11th as you get up early in the flight where there's still a lot of fuel right. on board, true. not later in the last half hour when you're drained out. Absolutely true, but there, there are other, without getting into details, there are other scenarios other than September 11th, and I'd only remind you mm -hmm. that we should not be concentrating right. on no, I agree with you fully events. on that, but right. I, I'm just curious that, that it, it's a rule that on its face, without some further explanation, doesn't seem to be helpful, but I'm willing to admit that it may well be. We may just be thinking of all the possibilities. I mean, it's also true on takeoff out of Reagan National. You're not allowed out of your seat right. during the first 30 minutes after departure or the thir first 30 minutes right. inbound. Uh, theoretically, that makes somehow makes people feel more comfortable if no one's up moving around. The fact is, Mr. O'Brien can speak to this better than I can, but I think the 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 flying distance between Dulles and and the Capitol building, if you will, is maybe three minutes as opposed to one minute from National. So I'm not sure why National is treated differently. Right. Why is it good for one, it's good for the others on that? Right. Maybe it has something to do with perception. It could be. It's window dressing, John. <laughs> <It could be. laughs> Thank you all very, very much for your testimony. Would the gentleman yield? Sure. She offered to tell us what happens if you do get out of your seat. <laughs> okay. Oh, you don't know? We had a, I stay in my seat, Mr. Well, we had, <laughs> we, had a, we had an incident a couple of weeks ago where someone got up uh, and ignored the uh, direction to sit down. He was tackled uh, and handcuffed by two air marshals who held him um, with uh, guns drawn while the aircraft diverted to Dulles. The plane diverts to Dulles and you're under arrest. And you're under arrest, right. And all, the, and all of your fellow travelers are greatly inconvenienced and will never forget your face as long as they live, I'm sure. <laughs> Mr. Hudson, you had something you were going to add there when Mr. Tierney was questioning you. No, I, I, just, I just think that uh, it doesn't take too much imagination to understand why they have that, that, that right now, uh, particularly coming in out of uh, Reagan National Airport. Um, it's, uh, well, I guess the imagination would be if you've secured the cockpit, you know, then, it, you know, it, it takes a little more imagination to figure why it's important the last half hour, so the last 45 minutes, the last hour, the first 45 minutes, the first well, hour. I mean, I, I would remind you that uh, we had another incident of a plane coming uh, to Chicago where an individual got up and uh, charged the cockpit door and uh, crashed into the cockpit um, and was subdued by passengers. Um, although we have some, some more bars on the doors, we by no means have fully secure cockpits at this time. And having a lot of people standing up at the bathroom next to the cockpit or other places is viewed by many as would be a potential uh, security risk. I have a couple more questions, if I might. There's no provision in the law addressing the non-medical, non-fireman, non-EMT person who is asked by a flight attendant or otherwise assumes a responsibility to act in a situation. Uh, where's that chart? If I understand the, under the volunteer emergency help, uh, there's no liability for police, firemen, and EMTs in terms of providing that assistance to crews in an emergency. What happens if there are no police, firemen, or EMTs, and a passenger is asked, for instance, 
as they would be in an exit row. Uh, is that something that needs to be covered in rules and regulations in terms of a some sort of a buffer from liability when properly asked? I think in our testimony we suggested expanding the, the types or numbers of individuals that would be covered, but certainly it's an issue that needs to be looked at. And I'll just give you an example. Um, there are some organizations who have people travel quite a bit and are connected with the aviation industry, and those people let themselves be identified to the crew or to the cabin staff as people who will assist if called upon. PWAs, people like that. Many, right. So, and that kind of assistance in today's environment, I think, is appreciated. Uh, so those kind of individuals, uh, uh, we would hope, would not be exposed to some kind of liability as a result of being the Good Samaritan. Ms. Friend, would the flight it, attendants agree? It, exactly. Uh, I mean, I think it's unrealistic to expect that after the events of September 11th, um, any passenger is going to just sit quietly, uh, as told, uh, in, uh, in a situation like that. And certainly people who are willing to come forward and help and offer their assistance should not be punished. They should not be subject to some liability. Mr. Roth, any observations? Well, I, I couldn't agree more. As a passenger, I, I've been, you know, flying and in a row, and we've all said to each other, anything happens, you know, we're going for them. <laughs> so, yes, um, I think there should be some sort of immunity, some good faith immunity built into the, to the uh, statute or the regulations. Mr. Hudson? Yes, we would support uh, Good Samaritan uh, type laws in that area. All right. These would be rules and regulations at this point. So, just. The other issue that uh, I was checking into the Red Eye flight last night, which I was just fascinated by, was the uh, new carry-on language. Now I'll, I'll read it to you. It says, each passenger is allowed one carry-on bag. Exception. One personal item, such as a purse or a laptop, a briefcase, a diaper bag, a camera case, or a small backpack. In addition, a food item, an assistive device, one duty-free bag a child restraint device, a coat slash jacket, or an umbrella. The maximum free bag allowance is three bags. You can check two and carry on one, you can check three and no carry-ons. It would seem to me that, I mean, it just seems very simple to me that the less baggage you put through the terminal-based screening process and into the um, cabin, the less your challenges from a carry-on security issue and the quicker you can get the people seated in the plane out. Now, this was effective October 9th. Do the regulations that the Department of Transportation is going to consider need to look at this again and more clearly define what may be taken on, both in terms of size and number. Uh, I mean, I've seen people, they walk down the, they walk down the, tra the, what's the thing that goes out to the plane? The jetway. The jetway, thank you. They walk down the jetway, they have a young child, they leave the uh, child restraint device, you know, their carriage or whatever, and they take the baby seat inside and they put the thing down. I understand that one. But, Beyond that, I don't understand why, boy, I'm going to get in trouble on this one. I don't understand why someone needs a suitcase, a closed carry bag, a briefcase. Am I missing something here? No, you're not missing anything at all. Beyond security, there are many safety implications associated with the carry-on baggage. I think that um, Pat can probably speak more closely to the problems in the cabin itself with carry-on baggage and I know that our organization as many as 15 years ago had petitioned the FAA to limit the number of carry-on bags and the size of the bags for operational safety concerns and I'm not talking about things flying about the cabin we're concerned about weight and balance there was one major airline that almost lost a couple airplanes taking off out of a high altitude airport in South America it turned out that when they weighed the carry-on baggage, they were several thousand pounds overweight because of the carry-on baggage. The normal dispatch requirements today give you a basic number that you 
allocate to each carry-on bag that you assume is going to come on. It bears no resemblance to surveys that have been conducted weighing actual bags in busy terminal areas. People have done this, universities have done some studies, students have done doctorate and master's theses on it, and there's some very good papers written about the situation from a safety perspective. Now, couple that to the point you're they making. Didn't, i got to tell you, Mr. O'Brien, they didn't need to kill all those trees and write all those papers to just do the common sense thing here. Right. Mm -mm. No. I mean, John's right. This is not a problem that was created by the events of, of right. September 11th. In fact, we have a petition that's been pending for some time with the FAA asking them uh, to issue a, a, uh, a carry-on baggage rule, um, a single bag and, and with a specific size so that there isn't all that interpretation. They have not responded to our petition. Um, however, in response to the events of September 11th, they did issue a security directive with this so-called one plus, right? Um, that security directive it could be amended, eliminated at any time. And then we absolutely believe that, um, that a carry-on bag limitation and a size limitation on that baggage must go into the regulations in order to ensure that we don't go back to business as usual um, as soon as the FAA gets a chance. I do think this speaks directly to the efficacy by which we process people who are getting ready to board on planes. I mean, it just... We don't tell them what they need to know. We, right. we, we leave them up in the air. And then they argue with the gate agent. Right. That's right. But uh, we, uh, the industry has resisted it as well because, of course, they they don't want to inconvenience or uh, disagreements with their with their passengers. But we noted in their testimony today that even they recognize the fact that if you're looking for a needle in a haystack, if you um, if you reduce the size of the haystack, your chances are better at finding the needle. We think that supports our carry-on baggage argument completely. Mm. Mr. Hudson, anything, Mr. Roth? Um, I think you should know the background for this uh, this issue, which predates 9/11. Most uh, surveys have been done of uh, particularly frequent travelers find that one of the number one things they want more of is more space for carry-on luggage. Now, there's a couple reasons for that. One is convenience and one is security. Not security of the airplanes, but security of the baggage. A uh, statistic is that one out of 200 bags is presently mishandled by the airlines. Damaged, lost, delayed, whatever. Most passengers have gone through that once don't want to have it repeated. So there's been a great increase over, over the years of uh, use of carry-on. The other reason is convenience. It takes uh, generally at least another 20 minutes if you check your bag. And, in, and now in the, in the current environment, it's going to take you probably somewhere between an hour and two hours extra if you check your bag versus go to carry-on. Um, on the other hand, uh, we have changed our position from supporting the, 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 the prior two bag limit, and we now favor uh, going to one small bag um, that can be hand searched, um, which is more stringent than, than what we have now. And we also feel that uh, people should voluntarily reduce their carry ons, and uh, we've suggested that for large airports, perhaps you should have a line for no carry on luggage. It would go faster and would encourage people further to go to checking luggage. Not like, not like the 10 items or less where you get people with 12 items, but no carry-on. Yes. All right. I have no further questions. Uh, we're going to leave the record open for, a, uh, for 10 days. We may have questions we'd like to direct to you in writing. We'd appreciate your response. Today's hearing did show how much work we have to do on this issue to ensure smooth implementation of this new law. I encourage DOT to reflect on this, these panels' combined wisdom in terms of implementing these regulations. Our witnesses, including the four of you, truly have given us compelling testimony, and you are experts in your field, and we appreciate you coming here. Uh, I just want to repeat uh, what I said in my first remarks. We are talking about people's lives here. And from my perspective, we have no room for error. I may not agree with some of your comments about how to get to zero tolerance, but I'm hopeful that in the course of the testimony today, we were able to give the agencies that are going to issue these regulations some sense of what we're doing. My compliments to your people, Mr. O'Brien, Ms. Friend, 
Mr. Roth, thank you for coming. Mr. Hudson, I can't even imagine what it must be like to do what you do. And you have our, uh, you have our thoughts and prayers. Thank you all for coming. C-SPAN.org has links to current events coverage on the home page. And once there, you'll find a comprehensive archive of programs related to attacks on the United States.